You are listening to WOOPLP, Cleveland, Tennessee. Whoop FM is a broadcasting service of the Traditional Music Resource Center, and we play America's original music. Good morning and welcome to Old Town Cleveland here on Whoop FM 99.9. Or you can go to the internet at www.whoopfm.com. And Morgan, where do they need to call? Well, Ron, they need to call 614-5553 or if they happen to be out of the area, 423-614-5553. Hey, Debbie Moore, what's going on? Good morning. I bet a lot of folks said, yay, we're glad to hear Ron's voice. Him sounding like he feels better, and he's feeling much better. For those of you who have been kind of following his uh, activities here recently with surgery and stuff. Um, good morning. It is October the 10th. No, no, it was October the 7th, 2017. I'm trying to do two things at one time, and that's not working. And uh, it's a beautiful fall day. We've got some rain moving in from a hurricane that's coming in. We hope that that hurricane does not uh, leave any extensive damage on the shore. And um, we have today some folks here, and we're going to be talking about ghost stories, legends, true stories, um, all kinds of stuff today. I think you'll really enjoy the show. And will we have any embellishments? We will have some embellishments. <laughs> that's what I am you put sure. on your hot dog, get into yeah, some embellishments uh, on your hot dog. That's right. That's right. We have Dwight Richardson and Dennis Stewart with us today. And Dwight, I want to start off with you. We've got a big event coming up in downtown Cleveland next. Friday night, Friday the 13th. And what is that event? Uh, thank you uh, for having me this morning, Debbie. This is uh, the ninth annual storytelling event we've had. It's very unique to Cleveland. Uh, uh, a lot of people get this confused with uh, Halloween and haunted houses. It's nothing like that. It's strictly a storytelling event of Cleveland history and mm-hmm. mystery. And uh, typically, we've had this downtown at the Bank of Cleveland, and because of weather issues, we decided to go ahead and just move this inside so rain or shine is not going to be a problem. Uh, Lee University has uh, granted us uh, access here to the Black Box Theater, which is called the Buzz Oaks Theater. Uh, it's that new communications building right across from St. Luke's that corners um, Central and Okoy Street. Uh, it's a great place. The coop seats are wonderful. Uh, the only problem with this theater, there's about 150 seats. That's all the tickets we can sell. Oh, so my. if you haven't purchased your now, tickets. which theater is that? Uh, it, what now? Which theater? That's the Buzz Oaks Theater. It's called a communications black box theater. It's mm-hmm. the same thing. But it's right mm-hmm. there at the corner, and uh, it's a fabulous location. Mm-hmm. And they're very kind to let us have it. This is not a Lee University event, mm-hmm. but uh, the proceeds for this goes to the Ch- uh, Chamber, Allied Arts Council, the Bradley Chamber. That does great work. And the Cleveland Storytelling Guild. And that, that does great work also. Yeah. Well, 150 seats. You folks need to get your tickets right. this week because yeah. that will sell out quickly, I believe. Yeah. And, and you can get tickets at uh, Bank of Cleveland downtown or the Chamber. You know, in the past you had small groups, so you had to wait. So now you just come in and right. you'll get the stories. And right. It should be a faster night for the people. That's right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, Nobody's uh, going to have to wait in line. And sit down. Sit down. And enjoy the stories. Big old plush seats. It's wonderful. Oh, yeah, mm-hmm. that's great. Uh, I've been to several of them, and they're just great stories. And uh, uh, they, they set the uh, the storytellers, set the mood quite a bit. And, uh, Good storytellers. And, and yeah. Lead you in and uh, right. do all the things. So, uh they're great. And, you uh, know, there's a lot of work and practice goes into that. Do I, who else helped with this? Uh, well, I have a small committee, Robert Bradley and Christy Griffith from the Chamber, and Judy Baker, uh, who is uh, Judy's the storyteller. Arts, she's yeah, our, she's been on our show, the yeah. 
Yeah. Our listeners loved her stories about growing up in the country. Yeah, that's our initial core group that we get together. We start planning fairly close soon after this event for next year, mm-hmm. and uh, it, typically we have it just a few nights before Halloween. But there was a conflict with the theater, and you know this Friday is the, first the 13th year. Is perfect. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean that just fell in our lap, you know. And, and Friday the thirteenth is going to be a great night. The only issue with that is that's the tail end of fall break for a lot of people. Mm-hmm. But we think that 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 audience will will be fine. Now, uh, can you tell us what the stories are going to be yet, or is that a secret? No, no, it's not a secret at all. Uh, and I'll just tell us two or three as we go through the yeah. program. I'll start with Connie Gatlin. Connie is the uh, uh, president and owner of Cleveland City Ballet. She's a great storyteller and was a teacher for a long time at the, uh, the Bradley High School. She's going to be telling the infamous story of Nina Craig Mile and Bloodstains on the Mausoleum. Yeah. And uh, if you have not heard that story, it's a, it's an intriguing story. And uh, the thing about this, it's true. So we don't embellish this story. It's an actual true story uh, about why St. Luke's Church was built in the mausoleum and the bloodstains on the mausoleum. And it's, it's a pretty fabulous story. Mm-hmm. And uh, I won't tell a lot about that because I want the sure. people just to hear it that night. Uh, <laughs> Dennis Stewart, you know, is here with me. And he was talking about or somebody was talking about the bloodstains on the, the mausoleum. You know, they have tried to wash those mm-hmm. off chemically and professionally, mm-hmm. and it keeps coming back. So of course, we know it's not bloodstains, but that makes for a great oh, story. Yeah, Debbie, that yeah. makes it's, a great it's real story. Blood stains. I just know <laughs> it. <laughs> it was um, one of your actors, and his wife is Mrs. Claus, I call her, but I can't. Oh, think. Pete Vanderpool. Pete Vanderpool yeah. was standing at the mausoleum one year on the storytelling thing, and. and um, that was one of the years that you were able to do it outdoors, and I come prancing by, and yeah. I go up, and I start talking to him, and I'm telling him the story of the mausoleum and Nina Craigmile and, you know, you know me, a fountain of useless information. He finally yeah. stopped and said, who are you, and why aren't you telling this story? And I said, no, 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 you tell the story, you tell the story. But it was so funny because he was thinking I was... He wasn't quite sure I was real or if I was a ghost or something. Now, we want everybody to keep listening because we have a f- one free ticket to give away. Mm-hmm. Uh, probably after our, uh, when we open up the phones, you're about uh, in over oh, 20 minutes. So uh, don't we'll, call yet. We'll, we'll, call. we'll give you some kind of, you'll have to answer some kind of question or be the fourth caller or. 13th caller. 13th caller. <laughs> I'm not thing. sure we've ever had 13 callers. <laughs> yeah, we'll find out really <laughs> yeah, but, you, you know, your team's not playing today, so we've got to be a crowd here. Well, let know. me ask you this. How much are the tickets? The tickets are $10 for adults and $5 for students. Mm-hmm. Now, the only uh, disclosure I need to make here, this is, you know, not a haunted house. No one's going to jump out and scare you or stab you, but it's not really appropriate <laughs> for children much under five or six years old. And it's not that they're not welcome. The issue is in that setting when everything is pitch quiet and the storytelling, if they're scared or they start crying, it just kind of breaks that. And we don't want any children to be scared. Uh, some of these are pretty mysterious Well, stories. and you have to kind of say, can they sit still and listen that long quietly? Yeah. As mm-hmm. well as ch- uh, kids are really impressionable. So. Right, they are yeah. very impressionable. Yeah. Yeah. But it's fun. And I used to tell stories to uh, my third graders all the time. The, let's get this call. Hey, good morning, caller. How you doing, Ron? Good morning. Hey, Brett, Brett how are you? Good. How you doing, Dad? I'm fine, dear. What's going on? Hey, I have something to tell you guys. Okay. I'm going to be going down to see Coldplay today. Yeah, Cole Coldplay's going to be starting for UTC, former quarterback at Bradley High School. He's uh, getting a start today. Yeah. I'm going down. I'm going down to see him. I'm going down to see him play his first get his first game. Yes, he. And we wish him a lot of luck playing against Furman today. Yes, and that game is at four o'clock. Four o'clock at Finley. Hey, it's homecoming. Oh well, he's gonna go get a good crowd and uh, hope a lot of Bradley folks go down and watch it. No, no UT game today, so no excuse to go to watch. Some UTC mock football. Yeah. Hey, I'm I I'm glad I saw you Friday night, Ron. Oh well, I was glad to see you too. Yeah. Even though you had on the wrong type of shirt, we uh, you. Was... Yeah. 
they they ended up losing that game, by the way, Ron. Oh, I was there. Yeah, they they was uh, fifty nine thirty eight. I think was the final. Yeah, yeah. Hey, all right, Ron. Uh, have a good uh, rest of your day. Same to you, Brent. All right. Bye bye. Uh, the uh, th- this is a great event. Like I said, we're going to give away a ticket a little later on, so please listen in, and uh, we'll give you some kind of a little yeah. ideal or something. But uh, and uh, Dennis Stewart's here with you, and uh, he wrote a book, read a book. Well, and matter of fact, uh, I'm honored that he's going to be with us today, and uh, he wrote two books that we're going to be telling about. Oh, okay. And, and I'm just going to, if it's okay, just let him talk just a briefly a little bit about the suicide of Lily and Hutzel. Melissa Woody from the Chamber will be telling that story. Okay, and, yeah, I don't know that story. Uh, so, yeah. It's a, a sad, fabulous story that we're not embellishing this story. This was a true story. Okay, and, uh, uh, Dennis, give us a little bit of insight there. Um. Well, how this all got started, there was a uh, uh, a man in... Garrett, move it right in front of you there. there oh, you okay. Go. There you go. Uh, um, the, the, there was an el- elderly gentleman in Athens. He was a decorated uh, veteran of World War II and a successful businessman in Athens af- after the war. And right towards the end of his life, he started talking about his cousin, Lillian Hutzel, who he claims was was murdered so I got interested in the story and thought I would do some research and see if there was anything to it beyond rumors and uh, what I found was quite remarkable a lot of evidence uh, documentary and forensic in the court records to back his story uh, that that his cousin was murdered her name was Lillian Hutzel she worked at uh, the Athens Bank in 1929 and this was about two weeks before the stock market crashed and her bosses were embezzling from the bank, and they tried to make her the scapegoat. And then a few days later, she was found dead at her house. It was ruled suicide. Um, however, upon very stringent investigation, it looked very questionable because the people allegedly involved in her death were the city's elite business leaders um, she, um, she her suicide letter was written in somebody else's handwriting uh, and later uh, she was supposed to have committed suicide with a a 25 caliber automatic pistol now the bullet went through her body and lodged in the wall 25 calibers won't do that. So we think that she was killed with a, uh, a larger caliber weapon. In fact, I found a, uh, a record. Uh, ironically, uh, in the law office of the opposing lawyers that said that she was killed with a higher caliber uh, pistol, possibly a, a 45 caliber. Um, the police were never called to testify. Uh, the doc, the doctor who was there on the scene, he was called to testify about her death, and they were asking him all kinds of ballistics questions, which he couldn't answer. That was not his field. I thought that was very strange. Mm-hmm. Um, well, our local sheriff, I mean the <coughs> Cleveland Police Department guy Trotter, Arthur Trotter, I believe he's the first person in the area to uh, be trained in fingerprinting and stuff and that was in the 40s mm-hmm. i just don't think the skills were there people didn't know how to do that stuff if it wasn't obvious they didn't have they couldn't prove things like we can now well yeah friends this was still in the future that mm-hmm. uh, they in 1929 they had fingerprints but it was mostly in the big cities mm-hmm. uh, i think he had to go to knoxville or memphis for the training and then he was the only, he was doing the fingerprint reading for chattanooga at that time <laughs> oh. i mean that tells you something right there well, Debbie, uh, Lillian Hutzel's one of her best friends was from here in Cleveland. Her name was Eula Barnett, uh, Eula Hampton. I don't know which people might know. If there's any listeners happen to be listening today that would know of Eula uh, Hampton Barnett, uh, if you could 
call or, or text or something to give us some information. I'd like to talk to you if possible. I'd like to get a little information on Eula because Eula will be one of the one telling the story from Eula standpoint. I love that, that she's telling the story. So they, they, they thought that she was shot with a different caliber the pistol than she owned. Is that what you're saying, Dennis? Yes, uh, the, uh, the Knoxville uh, police, ironically not the Athens police, mm-hmm. but the, the Knoxville police reported that the gun that she allegedly committed suicide with had never been fired. Uh, the newspaper reported that she had, uh, that it was probably an accident that, uh, that, she, that she was cleaning her guns and accidentally shot herself. However, there was, what's suspicious about that is that there was uh, oily rags and gun oil on her, bed, on her bed next to her body. Now, you tell me what, a fash- what fashionable woman puts oily rags with gun oil on her bed to clean her gun. So that's, that sent up red flags right there. And to make it worse, after her death, uh, her banker bosses tricked her father into signing over uh, her life insurance policy to them. So he, the father was the beneficiary. And it went all the way to the Tennessee State Supreme Court. Now, this is what's really amazing about this story. You got Lillian's father, Ernest Hutzel. He takes Athens' leading business icon all the way to the Supreme Court because they, they, have, they have tricked him out of the, the life insurance money. Mr. Hutzel beats uh, the banker at the Supreme Court in 1934. The Athens newspaper does not report it. Hmm. Hmm. Very interesting. Uh, Debbie, I I received a phone call maybe a week or so ago from a relative of Lillian Hutzel that lives in Athens, and he wanted to get some information about the storytelling event, and I told him all about it. He said he was a year and a half old when Lillian had passed away, and he said, my family just won't talk about this, this, this murder or this suicide. Really? And, and it was just really kind of cute. So he plans to be there that night, mm-hmm. and I wanted him to come because I wanted him to meet Dennis Stewart. Uh, but he said that's still a hush-hush thing in their family. Mm-hmm. Now, Dennis, you won an award for that book last year, did you not? Yeah, and uh, the same, same time, uh, y'all won your award. Yeah, yes. we, were, we hadn't seen you in a while, and there we all were together yeah, in Knoxville. He, he got an award for... Uh, 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 well, I forgot the, what title it is. It was the Lillian book for. Yeah, the Lillian book, but the uh, what was the name of the award, award of distinction? The award of distinction, yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we were in That's a, a different bigger category. word than we can remember today. We, we won an award for this radio show the same day, but the East Tennessee Historical Society recognizes people who saves history in the East Tennessee, and mm-hmm. uh, Dennis got his award mm-hmm. there last year. So congratulations to you. Well, thank you. I'm I'm sort of surprised that I won because I knew it was like a, like a very unorthodox type of book to uh, put up there, and controversial. And I w- I was really surprised mm-hmm. that I think I think uh, they they like the, the history part of it. Well, you know, some they're always look they're always encouraging people to go outside the box. I think, and uh, so I'm really tickled that you you won the the award there. The, the do you other, have a presentation that you do with that book? I mean, about that have have you done any presentations on that? Um, it's a little it's a kind of a difficult subject to talk about, I guess. Yeah, a lot of people are nervous about me writing that book in particular because they're still relatives around but uh, uh, uh i sort of like the battle of athens people still don't <laughs> like to talk about that but, right right yeah well, but, uh, when this article was in our paper was a year year and a half ago something like that there was uh, an article about this book and you and that's where i first i'd never heard the story and when i heard that read that story in the paper I contacted Judy Baker and I said, I think we've got a story to tell here for our next one. So that was about a year ago, I guess, because it was a fascinating article in the paper. And I thought, I believe there's a story here. Yeah, it's a, yeah. I, I remember reading a little bit about the story when we were up there, and but I haven't read the book yet. I want to, I want to do that. Well, I'll get you a copy. Let me tell you something really amazing about this story: is that uh, her her best friend was uh, was Eula Hampton who later became a successful businesswoman in Cleveland. Uh, uh, she went to uh, Tennessee Wesleyan College, Eula did, 
and Lillian actually helped pay for some of her school. I mean, they were really, really, that big sister, little sister relationship. And uh, we found a note in uh, a cryptic note in Eula's Bible. Hmm. And it took us a while to decipher it. But when we did cipher, decipher it, uh, it was a note saying that, that she, Lillian, was in trouble at her house. And uh, her, uh, her, her caretaker in her elder years, a man named Billy Cabrera, who, who's going to be at the uh, event, uh, he said, you know, I was looking through her Bible, and I've had her Bible all these years, and I never noticed this note in it. So apparently this was something so important that Eula felt she, she should keep it in her Bible. Was, it, was she in some kind of relationship, or was it a family member that maybe she was afraid of? Or it sounded like the bankers were just, she worked for them, and you know, that yeah. a male-dominant. Well, maybe she knew and something the they didn't want everybody to know. Yeah. Yeah, you have to remember, this is the late 20s, yeah. Yeah. And, and women did not own anything. Women really didn't do a whole lot of stuff. It was right. the male culture. Mm -hmm. And when you're up against a powerful banker, you're yeah. not gonna you're not gonna ruffle the waters too much. Yeah, so, interesting. Uh, yeah, and guess, so, who's telling this story? Uh, Connie, uh, I'm sorry, Melissa Woody will be telling that. You know, Melissa Woody's oh. great. And I will tell you, she's you know, I told you a while ago, she's she's already cut her hair. She's gonna have the hairdo of of Eula or uh, uh, that little curly bobby look thing, whatever. Yeah. And uh, she's excited about this, and how we're going to approach this is uh, she's going to be Eula Hampton, and she'll be telling the story of her best friend, uh, Lily and Hutzel. And Lee University has, the art department has made a tombstone uh, replica of Lily and Hutzel's tombstone, so we'll have that on stage, <laughs> and uh, Melissa will be bringing flyers to visit that tombstone late one night. Isn't that good? Oh, yeah. That's good. That's, that's good. a good way to approach it for the Friday the 13th story. That's very interesting. The uh, the other story, the other book that Dennis has written is called uh, The the R Real Homer Simpson. The story. What is it? The, the Real Homer Simpson. Simpson. Okay, is that it? And, uh, yeah. It, it was. I, yeah. I know it was available at the museum here. If you don't have a copy of this book, you need to get this. I was telling Dennis earlier that last time he was here and he gave us a copy of this when we left. We were going somewhere that day, several hours away, and I read this out loud to Ron while he was driving. <laughs> but uh, the story is about a uh, a gentleman named Homer Simpson that lived here in Cleveland, related to a very some very prominent family here in Cleveland, yes, yes, Marshall there. Robinson and. Uh, Marshall Lindsay Robinson, Hancock, uh, and uh, yeah. he's related to all those. But, Richie uh, uh, Hughes. Yeah. He, uh, yeah that's but he was the chief of police at one time. I'm going to give you a real quick summary. He was the chief of police of Cleveland, and five or six years later, he's in the electric chair in Georgia for murder. But how it gets from there to here, or from there to here, it was a, uh, the story was sometimes just absolutely comical. Yeah, well, well the, it was like in a sad sort of way. It, it's mm -hmm. these bank robbers who don't have a lot. Don't have, everything goes wrong, mm -hmm. and then, but <clears throat> they're eventually caught, and two guys end up in an electric chair, and even that went partially wrong. <laughs> so, <clears throat> I've told Dennis that this needs to be made a movie. If there's mm -hmm. ever a book yeah. that ever needs to be made a movie, this is it. Mm -hmm. Right here, <laughs> Morgan's going. Let me see that book. Uh, but well, it, it's a very, it's a sad, tragic, fascinating story. Yes, and to tie into that, I believe this year on the cemetery tour that's coming up on the twenty eighth of October, I believe on Sunday afternoon, I believe Homer Simpson's going to be one of the oh, good, good. characters. That's a, that's a fabulous because. They're doing the World War One now. Don't hold me to that, but I think yeah. that that's the plan. He's well, one of the uh, characters. You know, Homer Simpson was electrocuted in Milledgeville, Georgia, I think, where where the uh, electric chair was at that time. Mm -hmm. Brought back to Tennessee, buried here at Fort Hill Cemetery, one of the largest funerals ever in the history of Cleveland still today. Well, actually, it was uh, in 1929, Homer Simpson's funeral was the largest funeral in the history of the state of Tennessee until Elvis Presley. Oh, that's crazy. <laughs> That's oh, crazy. how convenient, because we're doing the Elvis Presley story also. How good. Uh, well, uh, and another thing a lot of people don't realize, 
There was a, a funeral home downtown called McLean Funeral Home. Mm-hmm. McLean Funeral Home is right behind Cafe Roma, right yes. now where uh, the yes. uh, Steve, whatever, I can't remember yeah. his name now. That was McLean Funeral Home. That's where he was brought back to when McLean Funeral Home took care of his body. Mm-hmm. Now, his dad was Carlos, wasn't it? Uh, I'm not who, who's, who's Paul? Uh, who was uh, Halber's dad? Uh, uh, Jacob Simpson. He was a Tennessee state representative who voted on the 19th Amendment to give women the right to vote. Right. Then, now, who's Carlos? I, I have read the book uncle here. Uncle or something. Uncle or something. He, he was a barber. barber shop. Yes, um, that was Homer's uh, brother-in-law, Carlos Robertson. There you go. That's how the ro- That's Marshall's father. Oh, that's Marshall's, Marshall's father. father. Yes, yeah. I've okay. got it now. Yeah. This is like who's on first. Yeah. yeah. But uh, it's uh, it is probably one of the most <laughs> interesting stories. Like I say, though, it has these moments where you just you just bust out laughing and say, "Well, God, how could things go so bad?" Yeah. And they start over again. And it goes bad again. Yeah. And uh, but uh, but. It, now, how are you related to Homer Simpson, Dennis? Are you related? Yeah, uh, he's uh, talking to the microphone. Oh, he's a, s- I believe, a second cousin. Okay. Uh, okay. His fa- uh, Homer Simpson's father's brother is my great great grandfather, okay. and so um, yeah. But uh, the, th- the, s- the sad thing about uh, Homer's father, Jacob Simpson, is of course they they were not wealthy people. And so uh, they pretty much went into bankruptcy with lawyers trying to save Homer's life. Mm-hmm. And Homer's agony was what he was what he put his family through. Mm-hmm. And I think William Prince's father was one of the later attorneys for Homer Simpson. That's, that's right. That's mm-hmm. right. William Prince here. Yeah. So uh, and now uh, Mr. Simpson was uh, involved in the Church of God, right? Was he a yeah. pastor? Yeah. Yeah, he, he he was he was one of the founders, sort of of the. A lot of people don't know this that Jacob Simpson and his family played a role in the founding of the Church of God in Cleveland. And see, they were initially Baptists, and this is kind of funny. They lived in Mattman County before they moved to Bradley County, and and Jacob Simpson, Homer's father, was kicked out of the Baptist Church for heresy. <laughs> well, and also to add to that, uh, I don't know if you know this, the. Um, uh, Eddie Robertson, who wrote a family book. Eddie Robertson is Marshall Robinson's son. Right. Mm-hmm. Robertson's son. And he wrote a family book, and he includes about 40 pages in his family book mm-hmm. about Homer Simpson. And Homer Simpson uh, was madly in love with Halsey Tomlinson. Halsey Tomlinson is A.J. Tomlinson's daughter. And A.J. Tomlinson did not want them to get together and did not want them to date, did not want anything to do with Homer Simpson. Well, and, Homer had sort of left the church a little bit after he got a, a young adult, and mm-hmm. uh, mm-hmm. he became the chief of police and was, mm-hmm. had been known to run with maybe women of the night <laughs> or something of that nature. Mm-hmm. So, But, and of course, he, he goes from being religious to non-religious to converting back. and. Right. All the stories, like I say, did she done an unbelievable jo- uh, job in that book? It's uh, and uh, I want to go see it on the big screen somewhere. Yeah, yeah. the real Homer yeah. Simpson. What a well, title for a movie. They had such a love affair that uh, once they finally got broken up, if you remember, Homer never married, and Halsey never married. Neither one of those people ever married again. And I believe you. I think you called Jacob's name a while ago. Is I believe that's the family that sold the property for one dollar. Where North Cleveland Church of God is now, yeah, oh, that's correct. Okay. That's it. That's it. And of course, Marshall Robertson was a uh, chaplain for the Tennessee State Prison, right. which was a, a kind of a uh, prelude to the Green Mile. Yeah, he, he did a lot of uh, uh, final prayers yeah. for yeah. people going to the lecture chair. I mean, it, it, it just gets fascinating. Well, the first picture I saw of Homer Simpson, they had it at the McMinn County Courthouse, and his head had been shaved. For, for the upcoming execution, mm-hmm. I thought that some it was just kind of sitting up on a shelf, and I went, "Woo, who's this dude?" And, the, and somebody yeah. started telling me the Homer Simpson story, and I thought, "Man, R- real quick, yeah. uh, his army buddy came back after he got out, and Homer had lost his tr- politics. You'd never think there'd be politics in Cleveland, did you? But Homer <laughs> had been in, he got out, got back in, and he lost his job. Politics changed in Cleveland, so and his friend says, "Hey, I've got an idea." For some work, and of course the, the work was a 
was a very interesting style bike robbery, uh, which it, you read all that, that's comical. But uh, uh, both of them were sentenced to, to die, and his friend had said, uh, I would die twice for Homer because it was really not his fault. That's when they electrocuted the guy, and he didn't die. <laughs> yeah. 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 So they had to electrocute him the second time. So but a lot of people said he died twice for Homer Simpson. <laughs> well, for, for the listeners listening, I uh, just want to remind them that the Homer Simpson story will be told on Friday the 13th at the Lee University Black Box Theater uh, at an event called Spirits, Legends, and Lore. If you want a little more information, if you I don't have a website, but if you'll go to Facebook, and just search Spirits, Legends, and Lore. It will give you just a snippet of all those uh, things. And let me tell you this. The storyteller for the Homer Simpson story will be Greg Glover from Channel 3. He's a news anchor. Oh, yeah. Oh, neat. He, if you've never heard Greg tell the story, he's, I have he's pretty fabulous. It's, uh, uh, I want to see the movie. Yeah, that's, that's, you know, I, I'm well, reading, we're working on it. I'm reading to Ron in the car, and... Every time I take a breath, he goes, this needs to be a movie. Well, oh, my gosh. They just ran off the road and had a wreck. This needs to be a movie. Deb was going through radiation at that time, and I'd take her up there, and I'd sit in the lobby going, wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I'd read some chapters twice. Just to get, you know, It's been about what, 10 and years then, now. Yeah, and then we'd come out, and then I'd come out, and we'd get in the car, and he'd start telling me the the, next, the, chap, the paragraphs yeah. that I missed. Okay. We're going to open up the phone to how you're listening to. Ron's woke us up, man. Whoop FM 99.9 here in Old Town, Cleveland. We got Dennis Stewart and Dwight Richardson here talking about legends, spirits, legends, and lores, some lies and some embellishments. Uh, we're going to give what? <laughs> we're going to give away a ten dollar ticket to the Friday the Thirteenth Spirits, Legends, and Lores. Going to be here at Lee University. What do they have to do to win? Somebody come up with an idea. I think they need to have the 13th caller. Oh, and, we'll try that. We've never had them. Do you want to do a trivia question? Let's do uh, Let's, let's just, just do a trivia question. question. Who was the former chief of police who died in an electric chair? Yeah, <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Call good. us and tell us. If you know that, you can win a $10 ticket. <laughs> well, while we're waiting for someone to call. They know it's nobody. It hadn't been anybody in the last five or right. six years. So, yeah. Dwight, what do you do? What when you're I not, do? what do you do when you're not out telling stories? Well, I need one more job. I own a wedding. <laughs> I own a wedding and event company called Fenimore's. Yes. And then also uh, I am a real estate agent with Vendor Realty. Okay, good deal. Good deal. I always like for our folks. So to, if you're to having tell a wedding and we're going to need a new house, you can take care Just, of both yeah, things call one me, time. Call me. I can do everything. Flowers, cake. Right. And. I do have. Well, I don't do cake, but I do, I do the well, flowers and the planting. You, you'll go get a cake for them. I'll go they get will, a cake. If, they, if they'll yeah. pay you, you'll go yeah. get a cake. Weddings right? have certainly yes, changed. If they promise to give you a bite of the cake. Yeah. The <laughs> <laughs> My son went to the, um, or our son went down to, at Silverdale and applied for a job to be a guard down there. And they were asking him if he'd ever had any tough assignments. And he said, I've been a wedding photographer. <laughs> <laughs> that, it is pretty tough, I'm telling you. <laughs> I have photographed weddings. The guy was not the least bit amused, and needless to say, he didn't get the job. Oh, but um, <laughs> I thought it was pretty funny. Yeah. All right, if you call and tell us who we've been talking about. I'm so hurt that nobody's called. Well, they'll well, call. Our, they, they wait but, about 11 o'clock to start calling. Is that what they they wait till 12 o'clock to start calling, <laughs> yeah. really. That's what everybody wants to call. I think there's probably a lot of people that, that know the answer, but they're not calling because maybe they can't get out anymore. We have a lot of folks that yeah. don't get out after dark. Yeah. But we'll we'll continue to talk. We'll try I'll to get through. We've oh, got somebody? All right. Caller, you are indeed live on Old Town Cleveland. Homer Simpson. <laughs> <laughs> have we got a winner. Who is this? Uh, Ray Jones. Ray Jones? Yes. Okay. Do you want us to mail that to you? Or, or do you want to you just come by the studio and pick it up? All righty. All right. Okay. I'll leave it here at the studio for you. Of course, somebody's going to have to be here for you to get it. All right. All right. Bye-bye. All right. Thank you. He's a regular Good deal. All right. Uh, you. Debbie, what? Can we keep talking? Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. All day. Uh, you got you got another hour no, I, didn't know, I didn't know if we have commercials or whatever. Oh, no. Yeah. We don't. Uh, not till twi Not till 11. Oh, okay. Uh, Debbie, you had mentioned Pete Vanderpool earlier, yes. uh, who plays the Santa Claus mm -hmm. every year. Uh, he has been a storyteller from day one of this mm -hmm. event. He's going to be talking about lights of the Presbyterian Church. Are you familiar? No, with I'm that not story? story with that. 
I'm okay. not familiar with that story. Go ahead. Now, this is a folklore story of uh, the first, the old the first Presbyterian the church, first the old church. church. Okay, one in Cleveland okay. that was erected in 1856. Uh, you know that how that. Uh, church was turned into a hospital during the civil war yes it was and because of that a lot of the young soldiers had amputations and different things absolutely it's uh the, the folklore about this is that you know for years uh it seems like they saw a young man with a lantern uh searching for his limbs and we're not sure which limbs it was but legend has it that he comes back every year to the presbyterian church trying to find his limbs and he's around the ground now what is fascinating about this story is the former pastor and i'm sorry i cannot remember his name he says he saw this light <gasps> and i don't think the pastor would lie mm -mm. i hope he didn't lie but uh, uh that was before a lot of the annex was built on the back mm -hmm. he had been there that long and 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 he had he knew about this folklore but he said he did see a lantern go about go around the window and that's a pretty good little folk right there yeah because, right you know, I, I, he he he's fascinating to talk to i don't know mm -hmm. where he went from here mm -hmm. but he's who's telling that anymore. story do you know pete vanderpool oh pete that yeah. Story. yeah i'll have to pay attention and, you know pete's pretty animated and uh, mm -hmm. uh it, it makes a nice story let's uh, it's called lights of the presbyterian how church. how long do you think the program will last the la it will last somewhere about an hour okay. an hour and a half that's something a, like that's that. a good time yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah let me let me tell you my ghost story from my childhood okay. not for, oh for no my teenage days. when ron goes let me tell you this story it worries me sometimes uh when i was old enough to drive so this is about 1970 all the guys around said there's an old house out here on bates pike you know, this old evil woman lives there. <laughs> he said, if you pull it in front of her house, she'll turn on the front light, porch light. And uh, they said, she looks out the window. So we had a couple guys. We went out dark one night. We were down there. So I think they said, we pulled up in front of the house. That front porch light got on. We spun tires and left. And the light's off when we come back. And we pulled up in front of that house. And the light come on again. We it was scared the devil out of us. We had not known about central lights. You know. <laughs> Those were new things. <laughs> you know, so in motion sensors. <laughs> so somebody that had, was Ron's introduction to motion sensors. We had lights. been we had been real neat because we just knew this. Some old lady, evil woman, there ready to yeah. come out and attack us. Uh, but yeah, we had to do it two or three times, and finally the next day says, <laughs> "Dummy, there's a central light on there. <laughs> What's that? How funny! <laughs> that makes a good story, though. Yeah." <laughs> You should. You could embellish that just a little. Oh bit yeah. Well, I've got. What? <laughs> one of my true stories that actually happened to me when I was with the sheriff's department. We found a body out on, uh, Candy's Creek, uh, Ridge. Ridge Road. It had been there. Now for, that was a few years ago when Candy's Creek Ridge Road was, was either popular. out in the country. Yeah. You know. And back in a ditch line, we finally found the body, and the animals had had their way with the body. All that's left was. His pants and his mm. boots, his head and one rib cage. And, uh, of course, we were looking around. It's pretty scary to go out and find a body laying there. So the coroner comes out. We work on the body. It's a fall, uh, October like this. There's a fog coming through that valley. We picked up the body and put it in a body bag. And every dog through the whole holla started going, Ooh. Oh, my. And talk about hair running up the back of your neck. I said, so that's my true story. It really is. <laughs> <laughs> that makes a good story. Though. I got yeah. chills just thinking about it again because it's just so haunted. But, you know, if you've got a, a, a old tale that you'd like to share this morning about something your family always said was a, a haunt or a story. A, or a hate. A hate. <laughs> a hate. Or scary moments that you mm -hmm. think were something else if you saw bigfoot <laughs> okay we got a caller Ron. go ahead caller you are live on old town cleveland uh, good morning mrs Marilyn. <laughs> i saw ron how close is that to yeah that's pretty scary when you see ron uh usually she says we're going to have to put on our aluminum hats when we stop we can't remember what it is we're trying to say somebody's name uh yeah that's the key that's protect you from the aliens yep I'd say the closest we probably all of us ever came to a ha uh, something that was haunted was the old house that the J.C.s did the haunted house in on uh, 
Is that railroad street out there? It was scarier with the lights on than yeah. with the lights off. Oh, we go out there in the middle of the day without any of the sound effects or anything, and the coach wheels would run up your back, and you could feel the hair standing up on your arms. And mm -hmm. I think, no, I certainly say that was the last one I worked in, but I don't think so. But, I mean, it was bad enough in broad daylight, and you go up there at night. I sit out on the back porch up there at night and help people down the stairs. And that was scary, too. <laughs> I was sure well, my favorite story of the J.C. Haunted House is with Anthony and Willie Bain. And who else was it, Ron? Me. Me. Okay. Tell the story. Anthony Dunn, myself, we were going to go over and open up the haunted house, get ready for the Halloween. So right the 1st of October, we went in this house. And it was a scary old house. We walked around downstairs. We walked upstairs. And there's one room that we used as the dressing room. We opened the door. And the pigeons had got in there. There's nothing like a flock of pigeons coming at you when in you're the already dark. Alone. <laughs> well, <laughs> they probably looked like bats, didn't they? <laughs> Anthony Dunn cleared the steps and was down to Central Avenue. <laughs> I'm running down the stairs as fast as I can, and Willie Bain's rolling behind me. <laughs> and we stood out front, and we couldn't breathe there, feel like that. And of course, Anthony's he's still going, and I so. But I'll and, go for help. <laughs> we was actually working there one night, and uh, this couple was back in one of the back rooms. And they, they had worked there for many seasons. And they said, we're leaving. Why? They said, something come out from under the cabinet, floated across the room, <laughs> and went out the back door. And their eyes were this big, and they left. i never seen them again. They're gone. They left. Permanently. Mm -hmm. you know I mean? So, yeah, I, I've been scared by not really ghosts, but natural things. I'm hearing music in my headphones. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> that must be for her. I didn't know if, if, if you have access to the song Bringing Mary Home. We can check uh, during the Tim break. Tim Poteet is going to be singing that song. If you've okay. never heard that song, a matter of fact, I heard it on Whoop. That's where I got the song from. Okay. Uh, and uh, it's a fascinating song about a young girl who appears in the uh, a dirt road one night. Snorting. Hey, Marilyn, did you have anything else? Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, that's okay. I just, I just remembered she was there. I was, oh. <laughs> uh, uh, we have a truck coming the 21st of October. Okay. Yeah. Sounds and, good. Uh, if they need to order fish, who do they need to call? Yeah. Uh, call T. Bandy at 478-2405. And he's having a yard sale this morning. And so Along with everybody else in the country. So sale. you're out on Young Road, off of Young Road. What's, what word, road is that? Is that Young Road? Yeah, Young Road is the main road, and okay. it's on Mall Street, and there's one across the street, too, so you get two for the uh, adventure of one. There you go. Thanks for calling. All right. Bye-bye. I'm sorry. I didn't right, mean to talk That's okay. Well, we not. do that every now and then, and the caller will start going. Yeah, well, I got so engrossed in his story. Do you want me to hang up now? They'll start saying. <laughs> We've got Brig and Mary Hope. We'll play it at the top of the okay. hour here. Okay. Uh, the... Uh, we love Tim Petit, by the way. He comes on and sings about biscuits well, and gravy. He been here today, but he's in Panama City well, at a writer-singer showcase or something. Yeah, no. Uh, uh, and he turned down a chance to be on Whoop. Uh, yeah, he yeah. did. Yeah, he did. <laughs> I think the scariest thing his... that we've talked about so far is that there's yard sales everywhere today. <laughs> and and there's that much junk. Those can be scary. There's that much junk out there <laughs> that you take it out of your basement or garage, and you sell it to somebody else to put it in their garage. In basement. <laughs> <laughs> what I need is for everybody to sell their stuff and have lots of empty bookcases, because I need lots of bookcases for my office. Well, it's I, pretty I, scary, isn't it, Ron? I think that uh, I've got a solution to all this. <laughs> if you'll go, this will help the economy. Get everything you want to sell or, or tart of, whatever, right. put it in the truck, Rent a mini warehouse, $25, and then don't ever pay it, and they'll sell it and get rid of it for you. You can't mint, rent a mini warehouse for $25. $25. Well, you can tell that that's we, a good thought. We, we just stick it in our garage. That we don't concept, know. how's that? That's a pretty good thought, though. Yeah, he said one day, he said, I've got an idea. Let's pack all this yeah. stuff up and rent a mini <laughs> warehouse and not pay the rent. Oh, I know. It. Or let's pretend we're dead and our children are cleaning out our house. <laughs> Well, that that's it. You know, we, our generation, we want stuff. You know, we keep stuff, and it's sentimental to us. But our kids, they don't want it. It, it means mm -hmm. nothing to them. Mm -hmm. And our stuff, when we pass away, it's going to be out by the side of the road. Like family histories yeah. and sometimes. Oh, yeah. yeah, we talk about that a lot here. We yeah. talk about that a lot here. People will go in, and they'll be somebody like me yeah. that has yeah. some huge, uh, let's get this call. <laughs> 
Right. Morgan's over here reading Homer all right. Simpson. All right, Collie, you're live on Old Town Cleveland. <laughs> hey, good morning, guys. It's Mike Smith. Hey, hey Mike, Mike Smith. You? Talking about scary things, how about that fire? <laughs> it was scary. We're, we're, we're getting there, though. It'll take uh, another week. Not for everybody to get up and going. Mike, but, uh, was there any damage to the archives downstairs? No, not okay. a bit. Uh, there was a There's story. my ghost story. My have you been down in that archives, Michael? Yeah, I have plenty of time. Well, I went down to get a copy of our deed, and the girl was kind of new then. This was three or four years ago, and she couldn't find it. And we're standing in the back of the archives there, and she said, oh, I think I know where it is. It's up here at the front of the, you know, whatever. You just stay here and let, instead of me following her around trying to find it. She walks off, and she gets up to the front, and two of the file drawers click and roll out. <laughs> on two, I mean, you know, one file drawer on two different cabinets clicked at the same time and opened. And I came kind of pale walking up to the front, and she said, did those drawers open? And I said, Yes, they did. And she said, I hate when they do that. And I'm thinking, just give me my piece of paper. I'm going to leave now. <laughs> oh, my. Yeah, there was only minor so, damage down there. And, uh, and all of it was, most of it was smoke damage throughout all the courthouse. But uh, uh, but then there was some wiring, electrical wiring issues are working on, heat and air and, and all that. But, uh, but, yeah, everything should be ongoing uh, in different locations uh, by the end of this coming week. But uh, I want to tell Ron that that, same motion line that got him out on Bates Pike got me and some of my buddies. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad I'm not the only one. <laughs> no, no, we, we, we did that. I've got I got one question, then I've got a story I'll, I'll end with. On, do you guys remember us? Uh, and we all went to school about the same time. Do you remember a uh, uh, ghost house, haunted house that a lot of people used to go to up Calhoun? I do not. It was, uh, it was uh, just, I'm younger than y'all. <laughs> No, not my mother. It was a uh, it was a big empty house up there, two story house set up on the hill. And I remember whatever road it was on is on the left side. We used to go up there all the time, and uh, I never will forget one night that uh, full moon about mm. the time of year, and we were up there walking toward the house, and all of a sudden we just heard banging. It sounded like somebody it might have been some other kids up there banging on pots and pans, scared us to death. And uh, you know we were we were seniors in high school and uh, maybe even been in college then and uh, we, we turned tail and got out of there but I, I always remember, wanted to remember where that house was up there to tell my kids and I never could remember exactly where it was well I'll have to ask my friend that's the historian of Calhoun I'm sure she will know well, one, one quick story uh, Ron was telling some sheriff's office stories <laughs> the wildest one that I ever had we got a call one night to go out to Lad Springs Spring Place Road, and if you'll think, there's, uh, I'm pretty sure they're still there. There was a patch of pine trees on the left side there, and uh, we got a call said there was funeral music, which is organ music coming from those woods, and they needed somebody to check it out. So we go out there, and I don't remember who was with me, but whoever it was, we rolled the window down there about the intersection, and sure enough, if you can hear it, it sounded just like you're walking into the funeral parlor. We turned around and we never checked it out and we never went in there. <laughs> <laughs> to this day, we don't know what that was, but I guarantee you, we just figured chickens even working back then to, uh -uh. to go in there and see what was making that Oregon funeral music. So, <laughs> I think my fun, one of the funniest sheriff's department stories ever told on, on Old Town Cleveland was when we first went on the air. Andy Lockhart said that he got a call that they were having a tent revival out where Calfee's is on uh, Durkee Road at at 64 Highway, and that somebody had reported that they had seen snakes being handled. And uh, Andy went out there, and he rolled up, and he opened his car door, and he stood up, and he said he could hear those rattles going. He got back in the car, and he said, everything's quiet here, nothing to be found here, and left. <laughs> well, I'm enjoying the show, guys. Thank you. Uh, now, Mike, tell us where your location is, uh, your relocation for the until the courthouse opens. It's going to be at 17th and uh, Keith in the uh, southeast Tennessee Valley, former uh, branch bank there. We're going to be there probably for five or six months, I suspect. So nobody has excuses for not paying their taxes. Everybody knows where we're at. So yeah. go. <laughs> Sounds good. Thank you, Mike, for calling. Bye-bye. Right, right, Ron, you may remember, and we had Wendell, I don't know, 
uh, I'm getting the names wrong, two guys from the Sheriff's Department came in. And uh, they said that they, oh, here comes another caller. All right, caller, you were live on Old Town Cleveland. Hey, Ron, it's Ronnie Carroll. Hey, Ronnie, hey, Ronnie Carroll, how are you? What's going on, buddy? I hadn't heard from you in a long time. Well, I, I listen to radio up there this, this week. Remember the old Specs Hospital? Yep. yep. Go up there by 9 o'clock at night. Probably you didn't get food. <laughs> what kind of things happened? Oh, uh, well, they, my sister was up there. And a couple other boys went up there to see her. Back in those days, the nurses looked like the nurses out of the spook place. <laughs> Go up those steps there, that those steps that you enter the building, and they squeak, squeak, squeak. Uh -huh. Oh yeah. <laughs> I have the guy up there, he was crazy. I think it was Wawa Wawa. 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 Walk on water. <laughs> That's it's what he used Abby to Bowling. say. I have Abby Bowling. Oh yeah, was that Abby? Of his day. We started howling and screaming. Man, we we went down Church Street past to get up. Excuse me for butting in, but. Dennis just mentioned I was I showed him a picture here of the Speck Hospital and he said yeah. that was Homer's Hospital. Yeah, the, the, uh, Homer's Day. Yeah, and that, that, yeah, was, that was the hospital. Yep. Yeah. yeah. That's well, great. The one as bad as was down there, that was a scary one. I, I, I've I've seen a picture of the PNS. I never was don't ever remember seeing it in person, but I do remember Speck Hospital. I thought my grandfather was in there for a couple of days. Yeah. But, I tell you, I never get, get scared down there. I still get scared thinking about it. <laughs> <laughs> all that good, good talking to you, Roddy. But we had these two police officers, I think, come on, and they said they got called out to Moore Road, which is kind of out in the Georgetown area. And some lady said, I keep seeing bubbles in the air. And they thought, bubbles? Well, they sat there for quite a long time. Of course, this was before the days of cell phones, so they couldn't record it. But there were orbs. They, they'd see the orbs, and there's a little cemetery there, and they'd see an orb come up, and he'd cross over the road. Now, this is two police officers that was scared to death said that they saw that. Wendell, that's what I'm thinking one of them's name is. But anyway, and we, I've had a bunch of people tell me the same thing about Thunderbird Cemetery, is that you see the colored orbs floating really? in the air. That's a good, kind of a good story. Yeah, it's kind of a creepy story. I, I had a paranormal experience in regard when I was writing the, uh, Lillian Hutzel book, and I think I already mentioned it yeah. to Dwight. Mm -hmm. um, I have a. Uh, I got delayed. Oh, is he? Is the caller still on? No, he's gone. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, I got delayed in writing the book because I was waiting on an FBI report mm -hmm. through, through the Freedom of Information Act. Is there somebody on there? Yep. Okay, go okay. ahead. Now there go is. ahead. Okay. Caller, you're live on Old Town Cleveland. Maybe we would have 13 callers today. Hello, who's there? Hey, I lost them. Call back. Call back. We'll, we'll get you again. Push all the buttons, Morgan. Push all the buttons. Every now and then, we uh, there's people that eat fried chicken while they're over there at that board, <laughs> and it gets kind of funny acting. Okay, go ahead, Dennis. Well, I was on my, uh, I got delayed in writing the book. I was waiting for an FBI report to come in the mail from the Freedom of Information Act. Uh, and uh, I was on my electric typewriter, <laughs> and this is, I bought this like in 1993. I was typing something. The typewriter started going crazy by itself. It started typing on its own. I, I couldn't, it just freaked me out. And it was just typing on its own. And I looked on the paper, it's just all gibberish. But then I looked at one of the sentences and it said, FBI who? <laughs> and I can, sh I can show you that. I got it. I, I like that. Look at Morgan. He's like, <laughs> and then Morgan says, what's a typewriter? <laughs> uh, oh I just wanted yeah. to tell everybody. Some of it's at antique stores, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Matter of fact, there's there's really funny like ones from the 1960s, little pink manual typewriters. You see them all in the uh, stores now, the antique stores. I just want to tell everybody that um, the books that I've just finished are now at the printers, and they're they're called. Um, it's a reference book. It's called uh, the 1836 Cherokee. Nation property evaluations. I just want to make sure I said it right. That's why it's taking me so long. I need my aluminum foil on my head. And it's we will two volumes. It's two volumes, and we will be having them book signings and things here. But it's going to be a couple of weeks. Ron, tell everybody about our meeting on Sunday. Yes, this Sunday is the uh, Bradley County Historical and Genealogical Society meeting. It's free to the public. It'll be at two thirty down at the uh, Cleveland Public Library Community Room. Paul Hickman, uh, local. Uh, 
gentleman here works for Edward Jones, I believe. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's become quite a, a pictorial historian is, for our community, yep. and he's going to show the diff- how Bradley County changed from 1960 to 1980. Yeah, that'd be fascinating. Uh, mm-hmm. And so he's got a lot of pictures. And, you know, and I was thinking about that is that, well, of course, the courthouse that we have now was opened in 1962. Mm-hmm. Uh, we the village mall we're seeing was just, open. Just it was been new. open. Key Street had just been built. Mm-hmm. Seventy, Seven. the interstate built. We probably got our first fast food or chain restaurant at, after mm-hmm. 1960. Probably that, Kentucky that Fried Chicken. Chef? Or no, that'd be Kentucky Fried Chicken. I think oh, would be okay. the very first the chef. national chain. Yeah, okay. yeah. And then of course we eventually got a McDonald's and. Uh, so, but, uh, but anyway, he's going to do that, and it's going to be, I think, really fascinating. Two thirty Sunday, yes. free to the public. Free to the public. We we like to have uh, everybody come out and see this. If you enjoy looking at old pictures of Cleveland during that time, this is this is the date for you. Uh, yeah, the talk about old downtown Cleveland. There's uh, only a ghost story down at uh, Stampers. I believe there's been several people that have been uh, have yeah, experienced uh, that ghost story. You want now that takes me a little bit to talk about that. Well, well, we'll, we'll come back to that oh, okay, one right after yeah. the top of the hour. But, Biggest little uh, involved. Let's let's talk about the event again real quick. Let's, let's uh, yeah, spirits, legends, and lore. Friday the thirteenth uh, at the Lee University Black Box Theater. It's one night only. Uh, tickets can be purchased at the Bank of Cleveland downtown or the Cleveland Bradley Chamber of Commerce. I want you to will they be available at the door? Yes, sir. If but there's I'll, seats first, available. First well, come, we, first serve, right? Yeah, we hope they'll be available at the door. Okay. okay. But, Apple Festival is next. Uh, no, t- two weeks from yeah, now. Two, three weeks, yeah. Yeah. Prater's Mill's next week. Apple uh, Festival's the next week. And I wanted to invite everybody to two places. Right across from Bradley High School, a good friend of mine has opened up a little candy shop called Tina's Tummy Yummies. She makes the most fabulous dessert. Tummy yummies. Tummy yummies. I saw that, yeah. You folks stop in and get some <clears throat> some of uh, Tina's things and tell her you heard Debbie Moore talking about you on the radio. You said about Tina's her. tummy yummies and Dwight and I sit up straight in the chair. That's exactly right. She uh, used to work in our kitchen at Black Fox, and she would bring food in, and she's quite the great cook, and she makes wonderful desserts. So please go see Tina. And then... Last Sunday, Ron and I drove up to Charleston to the fruit stand and saw that nice little lady up there, and she has pumpkins and gourds and hay and fall mums. She has and a bunch of them. She too. has a bunch of them, and she appreciates everybody's business, so go up and tell her you heard Ron and Debbie talking about her on the radio. So that is next Friday night, the 13th. Friday the 13th. What a night to go hear ghost stories. It's perfect. It is perfect. And like you said, very, very small children are welcome, but probably not their forte. Right. Uh, teenagers be great. Yeah, they, yeah, that, Lord, that nine and ten-year-old, they love that stuff. Right, yeah, they'll eat it up. You know, when we went, the last time we went, I'm sure the age group was from eight to 80. Yeah, oh, yeah, it's, yeah. it's all over the board. <laughs> and I just got a mint from... Uh, the light that is working. <laughs> uh, and also... He's all choked up. We've been talking about the book, The Real Homer Simpson. I believe you can still get that at the museum center here in Cleveland. Is that correct? No, I, actually, it's sold out at the moment, but I'm trying to have some printed up. I need to hook you up with my printer. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> He's a pretty good feller. Uh, but you've got to get a copy of that book. It, it is. It's about Cleveland, Tennessee. I'd say... Sad, funny, every emotion you want comes out of this story. And uh, like I say, Homer Simpson is buried here in Cleveland. He's not a cartoon character. Right. Some people not so, a uh, cartoon character, that's right. But uh, like I say it was uh, one time the largest funeral ever in the state of Tennessee, still the largest yeah. in Cleveland. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm sure. I think something over 10,000 people oh, 10, 000, attended his funeral. 13 pastors prayed or something like that. It was, yeah. it was a big, big it's ceremony. Pretty yeah. Massive. I mean, b- back then you didn't have televisions or, or iPhones, or, and and funerals were a lot of, uh, more of an inter- entertainment back then. Place to see everybody. Yeah, social event. Mm-hmm. Ron, as we go uh, into commercial here, um, I, we just, of course, need to remember the tragic events of this week, including um, Las Vegas. 
craziness that went on out there. And some good friends in our community who have passed away. We always play a song called Gone Home. And we dedicate that to all the people who uh, have passed this week. A good friend of ours, Barbara Irwin. But he's uh, personal life. Uh, known her ever since I was a little kid and grew up with her boys. And uh, she passed away it's that day. Also, Chip Chavis, somebody may have known him, was in the uh, insurance business years ago. And I don't know what he did the last 10, 15 years. So uh, they passed away. And after we play Gone Home today, we're going to play Bringing Bring Mary Home. Bringing Mary Home. And that's something, uh, something related to your program. We'll talk about right, that when we yeah. come back. Okay. We'll be back in a few minutes here on Old Town Cleveland. Hello. I'm the dog time. And you're listening to WOOPLP, Cleveland, Tennessee. Whoop FM is a broadcasting service of the Traditional Music Resource Center, and we play America's original music. Check in the cash, you got a brand new choice. A flexible loans really making noise. Flex your money, my soul. Flex your money, my soul. A check in the cash flex loan puts you in control. Visit your nearest store for details. Shape a flex loan to fit your needs. Make your next loan a flex loan and set yourself free. Flex your money muscle and check in the cash. Some restrictions apply. See store for details. Yeah. Yeah. You looking for something sweet? I know you are. Bring your little sweet self to the village bake shop. Around since 1961. There ain't a bake good in the galaxy. The Village Bake Shop can't whip up for you. So when you're ready to treat your mouth to a taste you won't soon forget, get over to the Village, village bake, bake Shop in the Village Green Town Center. Or give them a call at 476-5179. You dig? Matthews Pool and Spa Company, located in Cleveland, Bradley County for over 45 years. You know them. They're your new swimming pool construction and supply company in Cleveland, Tennessee, now with four generations of Matthews to serve you. Matthews Pool and Spa Company, for over 45 years, your swimming pool, construction and supply company, spa or hot tub installation and maintenance. Get all of your supplies for your pool or spa right now. That's the new location in the old Quinn Electric Company building by Behind KFC at 2724 Key Street in Cleveland. Call Matthews now, 476-4521. You better get your order in now for your new pool construction for this spring and summer. 476-4521. Matthews Pool and Spa Company. Going to jump in. Woo! Streets of your gold They live one by one As they were 
One dark and stormy night When a little girl by the roadside Showed up in my headlights I stopped and she got in back And in a shaky tone She said, my name is Mary Please, oh, won't you take me home She must have so frightened all alone there in the night there was something strange about her her face was deathly white she sat so pale and silent in a back seat all alone driveway where she told me to go got out to help her from the car and opened up the door I just could not believe my eyes the backseat was bad Wasn't that? Cleveland here on 99.9 FM, or you can go to the internet at www.whoopfm.com. You can call us here at 614-5553, or if you happen to be out of the area, 423-614-5553. And you might notice 
I do not sound anything like Ron Moore. That's because he handed the mic to me and said, hey, you're introducing the show back. And I'm like, all right, cool. <laughs> But the only thing I didn't like about that is Ron always, at the last minute, will say, sound like Marvin the Martian or sound do it with your British accent. What, what, matter of fact, tell us the telephone number there in your British accent. Oh, boy. 423 There we go. We do this every time. That's right. Okay, guys, we're going to give away two tickets to Prater's Mill at this time. And you have to call us, and you have to tell me where Prater's Mill is located. Not the exact address, but at, the general address. At Prater Mill. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maybe what's the uh, closest. Next to the water. Next to the water. Yep, yep. That doesn't count either. But call us two free tickets. They're worth $7 each, and these will be for next weekend. Please only take them if you plan to use them. So 614-5553, or if you're out of the area, Four two three six one four five 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 three. We played an extra song there when we came back. Tell us a little bit about that song. Yeah, that, that song. The first time I heard it, which was probably, gosh, I don't know, five or six years ago. Uh, I thought we have got to have that song sung live and in person at Spirits Legends of Lore event. And so I contacted our friend Tim Poteet from Southern Heritage Bank, and he was more than willing to do it. Uh, the thing about it. Those that don't listen to this channel would have never heard that song, so it gives a whole different opportunity to, to hear the song. It's just an eerie song about a young girl uh, late at night, kind of a ghostly uh, tale. Uh, but that song will be sung uh, at Spirits Legends of the Lord on Friday the 13th at the Buzz Oaks Theater at Lee University. Okay. Now, what story were we going to tell? It took a little bit long to set up, and we forgot. <coughs> See, so you got me choked up already. Stamper Ghost. Tell us about the Stamper Ghost. There we go. <laughs> The Stamper Ghost uh, is a uh, folklore story of, uh, about Stamper's Furniture. If you've ever been to Stamper's Furniture Store, you know it's quite a unique place. It's uh, spread out all over part of the um, uh, the block there across from the courthouse. And um, there is an upstairs. There's a couple of mezzanines level upstairs and some other buildings or some other uh, rooms you don't see. But uh, the first time that that ghost was seen uh, was by the Posey family. And uh, basically, it was the 1978. It was just basically uh, a mist or a uh, form of a young girl on the mezzanine level that just kind of went into the wall. Uh, she didn't scare anything. Uh, no one was scared. And uh, a lot of times, the delivery people would be in that mezzanine layer area. And it was like a little rush of wind would come through, and they would see the tags on the lamps and the furniture just kind of move around. And that just kind of evolved from there. Uh, we've told that story several years. And, of course, when we had the tour, uh, we, we stood in front of, actually, front stood in front of that store, and we had black lights. So we had the real illusion coming down that stairway on the left. Um, a couple of interesting stories since uh, just this year. About a month ago, I got a Facebook message from a lady in Alabama, and uh, she said, I was not planning on coming through Cleveland, Tennessee, but my trip took me that way, and she said, I love quaint downtowns, and so I was downtown in the area, and uh, I saw a furniture store, and it just kind of looked in, so I went in that furniture store, and I walked up the stairway, and when I got up to the top of the stairway, she said, I had the most strange feeling that someone wanted to push me down the stairs. And she said it was just overwhelming that someone tr wanted to try to push me down the stairs. She said, I wasn't scared. And, you know, it, I actually didn't fall down the stairs or anything, but it was just an overwhelming fear that somebody wanted me down those stairs. So she went up the other uh, uh, mezzanine level there. There's another stairway if you've been on the appliance side, the old appliance side. Uh, uh, opposite of the gift shop, and uh, she said, uh, I saw this figure go in a back door. There's drapes. Uh, she said it was like a drape, and she said, I'm assuming there was a door there, but she just went right through that door. And um, she she left the stamper, didn't tell anybody anything, went to Cafe Roma and ate lunch, and while she was there, she got to talking about what happened to her inside stampers. And the, the waiter said, oh, did you not know there's a stamper ghost? Well, she didn't know anything about a stamper ghost. And so uh, uh, somehow she got my name and my Facebook message, I guess, was Spears Legends of Lore on a Facebook page, and she contacted me, and she wanted to know more about what this was. Well, 
I didn't know who this woman was, you know. In today's world, you, you don't right. know what to get involved what in. What a nut they might be. Yeah. yeah, I said, I'm just barely going to tell her stuff because I don't want her showing up my doorstep someday and whatever. So I would just barely tell her barely things that I knew. And uh, she she told me several things. And one of the things she told me is she said, well, I'll end with this. She said, there was a girl pushed down those stairs. And uh, she said, she wanted me to tell you that, she didn't fall down those stairs. She was pushed down those stairs. And uh, so I was telling this story as it evolved to Melissa Woody, who's going to be telling another story. And it just so happened she had a high school intern girl there with her. And this little girl's eyes started getting wide. She said, I saw that ghost. <laughs> I said, you what? She said, I saw that ghost. I was about five or six years old. My daddy had set me on that mezzanine level, and I watched this little girl walk right in a corner over there where there's some drapes in a door back in there. Well, that was two stories identical, and neither one of those people knew each other. Mm -hmm. So it intrigued me because I thought I knew everything about the Stamper Ghost. I used to work at Stampers. So I contacted Joe, and I said, Joe, I said, and I told him the story. I said, both of these ladies have talked about a an area in the mezzanine level that had drapers. I said, what's behind that? Is there a door there? He said, oh, yeah. He said, there's a big room back there. He said, that's where we store our Christmas stuff. When I worked there, I never knew there was another room behind that doorway. And then in my research, I found out that that butts up to Mrs. Leeper's millinery store. Yes, that was and related Ms. to the Horners. Right. Yes. And Mrs. Leeper, of course, is related to the Horners, and the Horners have their optical place there. So at some point, there must have been a stairway that connected mm -hmm. some of those. And, of course, you know, right in that area is where a funeral home was. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, right. so, you know, it, it, we always yeah. would tell the story. Mr. That the Posey, came over. the older Mr. Posey that's gone now, would tell the story that he moved furniture. Of course, they've had a moving company forever. Mm -hmm. He'd move furniture for stampers and mm -hmm. deliver it and stuff. And he said he saw something. And he said the tags on the mirrors, they had the little price tags that were taped on. And he said it started at the bottom, and they tr just like somebody was walking by and it was blowing the tags, but there was nothing in there blowing, and there wasn't anybody. He, yeah. So I <laughs> it didn't take him long to look at it, I think, and get out of there. <laughs> well, I told Joe, I said, Joe, we've been telling this story wrong. So we're going to have to adopt the story because we've told the story. There's a massive stairway on the left side of that store. That's where we told the story that the Stanford ghost had gone into the to the wall. Mm -hmm. Well, it's the other mezzanine level on the right side of that store is where both of those had talked. So now we've kind of transferred that story to that corner, and it makes a good story. I'm telling you. Well, mm -hmm. Deb, Deb and I, you talked about paranormal activities. We uh, Deb had a friend, and I won't give away their name or their location. They're here in that. Cleveland, and they're normal people. <laughs> Okay. Normal, normal as you could be in aluminum. They don't aluminum. have <laughs> aluminum foil on top of their heads. Anyway, okay. so she kept telling them tell that there was things happening. They would leave and come back home and all the doors were open. Or, or, or they'd, they'd lay their keys down and come back. Keys are not laying there. And their dogs the dog, look. The dog <laughs> would look down the hallway and bark. So they said, uh, we want you to come out here. We brought our little recorders and went out there. We're going to be Ghostbusters. <laughs> we walked scared in, the bejeevers out of me. We walked in the front door, and and right over in the living room, there's a they had a little cabinet for their grandkids' toys. There was a golf club, came out a little plastic straight thing. across, and hovered, and then fell. She says they've already started, and I just looked. I went over there and I felt for wires and all cut nothing. She just picked it back up and tossed it on top of the so pile and we it. went. Okay. We looked like the dog. So they played with some, some professional paranormal groups have been there and played some tapes where they were listening and there's a voice coming from the background going, get out, get out. I'm going, well, if they do that tonight, I'll get out. <laughs> so <laughs> so we went in there and uh, we set I mean, up the, we did the little flat, flat, uh, flashlight test. You know, if you're in the room, tap that light. Light started flashing. Are you a man or woman? It would answer. And then in the kitchen, you heard bang, pow, 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 pow. So we all got one in and there. There's stuff in there. Then you heard it in the room we were in. 
It sounded out. like something that had heated up and cooled off and snap a natural snapping sound, but it was very loud. But this went on for a long time, and, you know, uh, basically I left and I haven't been back. <laughs> <laughs> I don't play you. What, what year was this house built? In the 70s. Yeah. What was there before? A mill. Yeah, Lots really. of limestone in the well, ground. There, there yeah, big limestone some, rocks sticking up out of the ground. There's some uh, hint of that the Union troops apparently come through there went through the water and trampled it dry, and you can hear the hoof prints. Hear, the, it, hear the hooves. Hear the there. You can hear the hoof prints. Well, the hoof, <laughs> yeah, well, you can hear the hoofs going through the dry creek. How about that? Uh, Dead family owned some of the property up through that way. That's and, how I got associated with this girl is that we were talking about the, she's living there now, and my family used to live there, and it was quite the interesting evening, but we have so, not been uh, back. I still have these Prater Mill tickets. Anybody that like these to use next weekend can call us here. At 614-5553. Tell us where Prater Mill is. Hmm. If you don't know, call me and I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Can I tell you about Judy Baker? Sure, sure. Please. Hey, Judy Baker is with the Cleveland Story. We Town love Field. Judy. Yeah, she's great. And she's uh, going to be telling uh, at, uh, story at Spirits, Legends, and Lords on Friday the 13th. She's going to be telling about the woman in black. Have you ever heard about the woman in black? Yes. Okay. It appears that in about 1895, uh, this lady would be uh, uh, appearing, and one night on a Sunday evening, a young couple was walking home from church services at Cumberland Presbyterian Church, and they got this eerie feeling that someone was following them. They turned around. It was a lady completely dressed in black with a veil, black hat, black uh, dress, shoes, but yellow gloves. That was the only color. Everything was black. Like a she, funeral? Like yeah, she was yeah, at a... Something like that. But she never heard anybody. And then the next thing they would know, they turn out she was gone. And this occurred several times. In, 19, uh, in 1893, mm -hmm. that was, eight, 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 it was 1995. Mm -hmm. So Judy T uh, Baker has embellished the story a little bit, talking about the lady in black. And there mm -hmm. may be a... A good visual effect there that we will we'll mm -hmm. provide that night too. Mm -hmm. But it's a great. This story. is kind good of the point. precursor to the Tall Betsy story, yeah. and they never figured out exactly who this person was. They couldn't figure out if it was a man dressed like a woman, because she was very tall, yeah. and um, she could be seen walking the streets at night, like yeah. walking from one place to the other. But yeah. she never spoke to anybody. She never bothered anybody. But it, the newspapers reported on it. Well, you know, a lot of the. Uh, Folk lords and scary stories we heard was don't go down the woods. That's where the boogeyman was. Yeah, yeah. Well, as you got older, you figured out that was just a, something your parents told you to keep you from going into the woods. Yeah, in one community over in Oldfield, I think it was, the fam the kids always talked about Soap Said Sally or somebody. Yeah. And it was some wash lady that was always out in her yard washing, but the families would always tell the kids that she'd get you if you were out <laughs> at night. And so... Um, uh, she was probably just some poor, innocent washwoman. Well, you know, when you hear that enough, it becomes kind of factual. Mm -hmm. And then and you, you embellish well, in your own mind. You have to imagine, you know that, yeah. in 1893, there were no yeah. street lights. No. You and, were just walking in the darkness, and you would yeah. just walk upon her. And in that time, I mean, you know, downtown was it. That's where everything yeah. happened. Yeah, yeah. All righty, callers, you're alive on Old Town Cleveland. Good morning. Hey, Miss Joe. Hey, uh, how's everything going? We are good. Yeah, good. Well, I just wanted to call in and let you know that I'm still around. <laughs> well, we're glad. We're glad Ron's feeling much better this week. I know you was a little worried about him. Well, he went yesterday and took his first treatment. Oh, your nephew did? Yes, uh, Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, it'll be okay. It'll be rough here for a while, but that'll take care of it. Well, Joe, they told me yesterday I have no treatments, uh, that I'm totally cancer-free. Well, good. I'm glad to hear that. Me too. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Yep, amen. To back. Mm -hmm. Just called it early enough. Without you. <laughs> and Debbie, I don't know what we'd do on Saturday morning. You wouldn't know what who would bring you your Jack Daniels, what it is. <laughs> <laughs> You have all the listeners thinking that we carry a bottle around with us. <laughs> That's oh, not true of either one of no, you. No, you poured it in a glass. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a lady never drinks out of the bottle. 
Well, I heard a man say one time he didn't like to see women drinking out of the bottle. <laughs> You know what you you know what you told him, don't you? Close your eyes. No. <laughs> oh, I don't know what we're going to do without you. Something ever happens to you, boy. Hey, I'm going to be around a while. Yeah, I'm going to see that you do. That's uh -huh. good. Well, darling, it's always fun to talk to you. Well, listen, have a good weekend, and I'll talk with you later. All righty, uh, dear. Bye-bye. Uh -huh. Love you, Love you too, my mom. She doesn't call. We worry about her. She calls <laughs> every week, and she Poor wants to hear. Poor old drunk lady. She know. wants to hear just a swinging every week. Really? Mm -hmm. My wife just uh, texts me, uh, and she had gone to the downtown post office this morning, and they've got the, the street blocked off there by the courthouse, and I don't know if there's something going on or what, but she said she rode the window down, and she heard singing, uh, I'm, I don't feel at home in this world anymore, so I don't know <laughs> what's going on that time, but, but it, she enjoyed it. <laughs> I heard her singing like that one time. And I would been, I was in the JCs, and I got selected. To, uh, they give me this special award, <laughs> and but to get it, you had to be uh, initiated into the what they call the, the volunteer. You had to court. drink more Jack Daniels than you wanted. Basically, to drink. you had to stand with your nose and your toes against the wall <laughs> unless you were drinking Jack Daniels. And everybody and all the other colonels This there. was many decades ago by anyway, the way. Anyway, they made you take off your belt, throw it outside, and you had to go out and get your belt and of course I found a belt that barely fit my neck and that's what I was wearing. But, but later that night they made you go on stage and receive your award. Well I was let on stage to let off because I'm not a drinker but so I'm laying in the bed later that night and all I heard Shall we gather at the river? <laughs> and it keeps getting louder and louder. And I slap them and says, You hear that singing? <laughs> Listen, you and me, Lord. <laughs> I, basically, we were over the, right outside the indoor pool, and a bunch of other drunk JCs was having them a baptism <laughs> down there, and I thought I'd done gone. How funny. That does kind of freak you out. I hey, think. if you have an interesting family story, a spook story, or a some kind of crazy story in your family you'd like to share with us they may just feature feature you next year on that's right Spirits, legends that's and right. lores we love to hear these stories you know ron and i went one night to the uh, storytellers deal we had the best yeah. time it is, it now they'll put you on the spot a little bit and i guess if you didn't want i didn't yeah. participate but ron did and um, i'm so bashful he yeah i was trying to get over it no but when you had to get up and dance or do something no i didn't have to dance oh, i told a story oh okay but it was it was fun. So they meet, I believe, on Tuesday nights. But you could, okay. you know, kind of get involved. I think they have a Facebook page, and you could kind of follow them through there. So happy presenter, happy stories are going to be. Uh, there will be. Uh, well, we were going to have seven stories. We've got a little snag on one, so there'll be six stories and a song. <laughs> I and, hate uh, when snags happen. <laughs> well, and it, it was beyond our control. Deborah Naren. I oh, her, her sister oh, yeah, passed this way. In the car accident, yes. and her aunt was. Was tragically killed in that yes, accident. I, uh, she's fine, but she, I mean, mostly she just cannot tell the story, and that's it's understandable. Right. Uh, so we will not be telling that story. But anyway, on Friday the 13th, Spirits, Legends, and Lore, one night only at the Lee University Communication Center. Our story turtle we haven't talked about so far is Rob Alderman. Now, do you know Rob? I do not. No. Well, I don't. I've never heard him tell a story, so but I've got people that say he's going to be fabulous. He's going to be telling a story about blue suede and co copper. Are you familiar with that story? Nope. I don't believe so. It's the tie of Elvis Presley to Cleveland, Tennessee. Okay. And, Besides uh, Dr. What's his well, name? No, no, not that one. No, no, that's a good story, too, but yeah. it won't be that. If uh, you're, I think it was in the 60s, I want to say when uh, Rush Funeral Home on McCoy Street burned. Uh, I, I did know. not know it burned. Yeah, it burned at one point. It, I don't know that it burned all the way down, but it burned mm -hmm. up. They had to redo the whole thing. In the basement of that funeral home was a copper coffin, and they have had it for many, many years. And I talked to Greg Rush, and he he's the one that first told me this story. Uh, they couldn't sell it because it was so heavy, and it was a little expensive, and it sat for a long time, so it went through the fire wasn't touched they shipped that coffin off to memphis uh because someone else uh 
bought it, and they didn't have a used part. They just liked it and bought it. When Elvis Presley passed away, he was buried in that coffin. No, yeah, I had not yeah. heard that. If you will look at the pictures, it was it took about eight people to carry that coffin because it was so heavy. Uh, so that's called blue suede and uh, copper, and mm-hmm. he'll be telling that story about the Elvis Presley. Well, I found in my folder over here that I always ca- carry in when we we're doing our spirit stories around halloween and i found this one i think maybe bob cash told us this i don't know it it could be a lie said, be true if he says it says it could be a lie at the vfw there's a haunted host ghost called Socko. he passed away sitting at the bar drinking a paps blue ribbon the girls the bar girls i put in parentheses say that things move and and uh, strange things happen in the bar ever since Socko passed away. And the owner has a German shepherd that uh, the dog will growl at nothing and the hair will stand up on the back of the dog's neck. Hmm. Well, perhaps Blue Ribbon. Well, if Bob Cash told it, it's got to be something. <laughs> I don't know. I, don't know what. <laughs> I apparently wrote that down when somebody called in, so I don't know. Another who. interesting fact about Cleveland, that, uh, and I think what's, there's an attorney here in town who's real big on this, that Elvis Presley, not no, Hank Williams probably died going driving through Cleveland, Tennessee. Really? I had never heard that. Well, you know, he'd come up, he was going, for, I forgot where he was, but he had to come up old US 11. And some thing was he stopped down at, uh, there was a bar named Ed Quirks down where the Cleveland Speedway is. I've got that name wrong. But anyway, Evans, maybe. He drank a beer there, went out, got in his car, and then, of course, before when he got to wherever he was going, he was dead in the back, back seat. So, possibility he died going through Cleveland. Well, then of course his car coming back home, coming right back through Cleveland, same point, way again. How about that? So I don't know if anybody. Well, you know, Elvis has a lot of ties to different people in Cleveland, Tennessee. Uh, I used to in my early days, I sold cars at the old Superior's Cadillac. <laughs> yeah. And a car uh, salesman there named Luther Hickman lived in Ottawa, and his wife. I cannot remember her first name, but her pen name, she was a songwriter. Her pen name was Minnie Hickman, Jr. She wrote the majority of the songs on Blue Hawaii for oh, Elvis Presley. Man. And then, you know, Joe Stamper. Then Bert, she babysat had, for them. Yeah, I mean, they were in the arm. I mean, it was, it's fascinating, the connection he has to Cleveland, Tennessee. Mm-hmm. You're saying that Elvis is buried in a coffin from Cleveland? That mm-hmm. was it, it set in Rush Funeral Home for many, many years in the basement corner. Uh, when they finally transferred that coffin to Memphis, uh, that's the coffin he was buried in. That's wow. Crazy. Yeah. I wonder and, who and Greg Rush can, can yeah, verify that yeah. story. I think a favorite story of wow. everybody's is the an incident that happened up in Charleston. There was um, some fellas that were doing something, breaking the law, and the sheriff shot through the door and killed one of them, the car door, and killed one of them. And he's buried up at... Um, in the public cemetery up there, his name was John Hobart Maddox, and he has one of the old coffins, I mean, one of the old tombstones that has the hand pointing up to heaven, and there's some kind of image that keeps appearing there that maybe looks like a pistol. <laughs> and we, Ron and I both have gone out there when it's 110 degrees looking to see if we can see that pistol, and it takes a little imagination, but yes, you probably can. And I think it's buried fairly close to the north end of the cemetery. That's the hard part is finding the cemetery, but I've got a copy of the 19, um, I, it's not a 1921 newspaper, but it's an article about the 1921 newspaper. Mm. It was published in 1964, and the teller of the story was C.L. McAllister, which was quite the historian. Uh, and- the other tie, of course, is Dr. Murphy here in town was doing his internship. No, it's Dr. Oh, Van. Uh, no, no, uh, no, no, no. Uh, Van. The, oh, shoot. Jerry. Uh, Van. Oh, shoot. Well, I don't, I've, I've got his name wrong now. Uh, Jerry. Yes, you do. It, it'll come to him. Oh, it'll anyway, come to all of us. We'll scream was, it out. Uh, he was an intern in the Memphis Hospital. They brought in a body. Jerry Devane. 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 There, Devane. Devane. there it is. He was doing Van his something. internship. Thank and, you. They're working on this guy. He was a heavy set guy, dark hair, had on some flashy rigs, they said. And he said, they taught you when you were an emergency room doctor not to pay attention to the face because you're working on a person. It could be your brother or your daddy. Just don't. So they're going in there and, you know, working on the guy. And then the hallway just starts filling up. News reporters, everything. Finally, he looks at the doctor and says, 
is this Elvis? Of course, I, I already heard him say, uh huh. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, and he said, Dr. Devane can, can confirm Elvis left the building. <laughs> <laughs> he said, I can confirm that Elvis El, is dead. <laughs> Elvis is dead. There is no all this. Elvis is still alive. No, Elvis is dead. He's not in Hawaii? No, he's not. <laughs> you know, because his tombstone, they misspelled his name. Aaron is not spelled correctly on, uh, is it Aaron Elvis or whatever it is? Okay, I didn't Aaron. know that. Aaron is misspelled on his, no, they said he's not there. Huh. Mm. So okay. there's your ties to Elvis to Cleveland, Tennessee. Mm. But that How was copper? <laughs> yeah, copper. Well, no, that's the copper coffin. Yeah, this, the, that's what, it was yeah. made out of copper. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I must have weighed 500 Oh, it pounds. was massive weight. That's why mm -hmm. it took eight people, four on each side, to carry that coffin, not counting his weight. Wow. That's how heavy that coffin was. Of course, when it was in the fire, copper's not going to burn. Oh, yeah. So I'm going to let it just belt or something. Yeah, termites ain't going to eat it or nothing. No. Uh -uh. It's a great, great, great thing. Mm -hmm. uh, on, uh, can I run through the storytellers sure, one more ahead. time? Sure, go ahead. Okay. Uh, we're talking about spirits, legends, and lore. Uh, if you could go to Facebook and search spirits, legends, and lore, uh, you can get a little bit of snippet of all these stories. This will be Friday the 13th at 7 o'clock. Tickets are on sale at downtown branch of Bank of Cleveland and the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, it's, it's not a haunted house. Uh, however, uh, children, uh, small children are recommended not to come because of the mood it could break. Or they, we don't want them scared. And, uh, but students are $5 uh, tickets and adults are 10 the stories that will be told that night, Connie Gatlin will be telling bloodstains on the mausoleum. Pete Vanderpool will be telling lights of the Presbyterian ghost. Judy Baker will be telling the woman in black. Melissa Woody will be telling the suicide of Lillian Hutzel. And uh, Greg Glover, the news anchor for Channel 3 in Chattanooga, will be telling the real Homer Simpson story. And Rob Alderman will be telling Blue Suede and Cotton. And then uh, Tim Poteet will be singing the song, Bringing Mary Home. Um, and we will start right at 7 o'clock. So if you're a straggler, you may have to stay outside for the first one because uh, of be the light coming. It's a black box theater, so we don't want to break the mood. Hey, folks, you listen to Old Town Cleveland here on Whoop FM 99.9, .9, or you can go to the Internet at www.whoopfm.com. You can call us here at... 614-5553, or if you're out of the area, 423-614-5553. we got Dennis Stewart and Dwight Richardson talking about spirits, legends, and lores, and uh, talked about Dennis has two books. It's going to be right. featured there. Uh, I don't have a second book. I do have the Real Homer Simpson book, yeah. which is one of my favorite reads in many, many years. Well, I'm going to try to get you uh, the other book, too. Um, I'd love to have that. That's the one that uh, I want to read about. It's pretty interesting. we got a phone call. Go ahead, caller. You're live. Hello. Are you there? It's up to you now. Oh, my. <laughs> Spirit may have got him already. Hello. Whoa, this is a ghost. <laughs> call back if you can there, please. The ghost says, call back. Uh, and we ladies, have a lot of demons here at Whoop. That's right. And ladies and gentlemen, uh, Dennis Stewart will be with us that night also at Spirits, Legends, and Lore. We're going to have him on the front row. So, uh. so uh, uh, he has not heard either one of these stories, and I think he's going to like them. It's been my, been my first year. Good, good. And, well, and uh, this uh, is, what's the name of the other book here? Uh, the, the Suicide of yeah. Lillian Hutzel. Right. It won an uh, award last year from the East Tennessee Historical Society for uh, 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 for distinction in history. They, they give out awards to people who save history in East Tennessee. Mm -hmm. We're glad to see. Uh, don't seem like a lot of the southern part of the state, Eastern, gets a lot of recognition. So we're just glad to see Dennis up yeah. there last year yeah. winning an award. And uh, let, let me mention, a lot of people may not know where the black box theater there communications building is it's the new building that fronts uh okoy street and central avenue 
and on the opposite side is St. Luke's. If you know where St. Luke's is downtown, and for you that have lived here a while, uh, when they tore down, I believe it was the Woolworth one under J.C. Penney. Yeah, uh, yeah, all of that. tore down that whole section, yeah, that's Pinnacle where that new communications building is. And there's uh, city parking on, on the other side. Uh, it, the old fa- it's, it's really a good landmark. Be It's between the old First Baptist Church and then they got that block where the theater's at, and then you got St. Luke's. Mm-hmm. So it's right. And in there's the um, there. adequate parking there yes. because there's parking with that building, and then yeah. you can park over at the city parking lot. And I, I always say, if you can walk a little bit, park and let somebody who can't walk yeah. get those closer spaces. Ten dollars. Ten dollars a person. Ten dollars a person. Five right. for where students. Where do you get the tickets? Uh, at the Bank of Cleveland downtown or the Chamber of Commerce. And, and you, you there can't. Will it will be some that night if we have some left. Right. You could try to come to the door, but I'd get them early. Yeah. Right. right. Uh, children, uh, you children, say school, uh, high school below five dollars or what's uh, two? Well, we we're saying students, so that could be grade school students up to high school. Okay. Now, All right. Not college. Ron, well, tell about the uh, historical society meeting tomorrow. Yes, historical society meeting is uh, Sunday, tomorrow at two thirty at the Cleveland Public Library Community Room. Uh, we have Paul Hickman, who works for Edward Jones. He's become a pictorial historian for our community. And he's going to show a pictorial history of what Bradley County looked in 1960 up to about 1980. A big change in Bradley County happened. We've become more than just a little self-contained city to becoming more of a, you know, nationally recognized restaurants and I-75 getting a, a different type of clientele off the roads here mm-hmm. in only 20 years yes it was a big change it was a really big change and, and he's also and one of his big interests also he's working on is from 1940 to 1960 from the war years up to 1960 after mm-hmm. two wars in right. that time period and so uh of course you know uh i don't feel doing vietnam war stuff but that that was a big change to our society also so but uh, i'm looking forward to see what he has uh that'll be tomorrow at 2 30 absolutely free uh, please come it'll last about uh two to two thirty it'll probably be the program will be about 30 minutes and then he'll answer questions and be av- around available afterwards you know talking about the change of cleveland i've only been here since about 1975 or so uh and my wife was born in chattanooga and they lived here in cleveland and uh when she was about three or four years old they bought a, a new home on peerless road which is right around Wendy's. And everybody thought they had lost their mind because, you know, and back then they thought it was too expensive and they were in the country, you know, back in that day. I mean, back in the, you know, right. the, the late sixties or middle sixties, they thought they'd gone crazy to move to the country. Well, I guess 25th street was just being developed. About yeah, that time. I'm not even sure it was developed at that. Yeah. I'm not, uh, I'm well, not Key sure. Street, Key street had come up that way. Of course, Paul Huff was, all farmland. Oh, yeah. Or where Paul Huff is today. Yeah. yeah, it's strange when you think about Paul Huff. I remember when they moved that house, uh, uh, right set in the very center there where Paul Huff Parkway yeah. went uh, down toward the, the Lowe's in the area. So, uh, let me mention one thing also. Uh, Dennis Stewart has written the two books we're going to be talking about The Suicide of Lillian Hutzel and the, home, the Real Homer Simpson story. Believe it or not, uh, there are still relatives that are alive today that are uh, related to Homer Simpson. Some of those relatives will be there. And the suicide of Lillian Hutzel, there are relatives of Lillian Hutzel that will also be there. Go ahead, caller. You're live. Well, I'm glad. <laughs> yeah, you got that confirmation. What's going on, Marilyn? <laughs> uh, uh, you had the Prater Mill ticket. Yes. And our sister, Johnny, who is in Florida, waiting on <laughs> Oh, uh, no. I'm sure her and, and, and one of her friends would love Well, to tell everybody how you get to Prater's Mill. Uh, Highway 60, uh, uh, go down into Georgia. There's a red light at Varnell. You turn left, and it's on the left at their, what, two, three miles? Yeah, that's right. Okay, well, I'll save these tickets for them. Thank you. All righty. Thank Bye-bye. you. Bye-bye. we we'll go through a person through a person, but there you go. All right. Do you have a couple more? Or that, no, uh, that's it. That's you, all you had. Okay, great. Uh, we had the Prater Mill people on here talk about the history of Prater Mill. Yeah, just, that's a fabulous place. Oh, yeah. It's, uh, when they first started the fair down there, they done it monthly. Hmm. And they quickly realized that was a lot of work. Yeah. 
Then they started doing it two times a year, and they said, that's a lot of work. So they do one big one now yeah. down there. So There's a lot of things like that that's unique to Cleveland. Yes. And, uh, and the Spirits, Legends, Lord is also unique to Cleveland. It's There's just nothing like it anywhere. Well, I can't believe anybody don't have any old spook stories. Well, let me tell there. you something. I couldn't get Laura Bryan Span to call in this morning. She's being bashful on us. But she said the old house in Calhoun on the hill was the Saw Paul Mansion. And when it oh, burned... So when it burned in the 70s, I believe she says that there were people who reported they saw the image of a small child up in a window. Mm-hmm. All right. But there was a small, small child in the building. Hey, go ahead, caller. You're live. Hey, good morning, y'all. Hey. It's R.D. Hey, hey R.D. R.D., what's going on? Oh. R.D. always has a story. <laughs> yeah, getting over this crud. It's been... Oh, no. Nope, nope. That hangs on like grim death. It just won't leave it. So, hey, I was going to tell you... My story, one of my stories of an unusual event, I think I've told it before, uh, has to do with groundhog hunting up north of here. Back about, and I'm not going to see you all draw your own conclusions. I don't. I still don't know what to make of this. But back in the early 90s, I was big into groundhog hunting. And I was hunting with a police officer up out of Sweetwater. I think his name was Swafford. And there's a place up there, you're going towards Sweetwater on Old Levin, I think it's called Head of the Valley or Head of the Creek, something like that. And at that time, it was just farm land. I mean, now this developed, you know, like everything changes. So, we're, bless you. So, we're sitting out, we're laying out here in this big, huge field, kind of facing uphill. We got binoculars. So, we got a view all the side of us, all behind us. And behind us was this road, little road that led down and crossing down 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 road a bit was an old fallen in house it just wasn't occupied it was just in the process of coming apart so so we're looking all around glassing all around popping at groundhogs all of a sudden look back and there's a man standing right behind us that i don't know where he came from because we were looking all over the place for groundhogs that's what you do but he was just there and this guy looked like he had stepped out of a black and white photograph from the Dust Bowl. I mean, old flashing clothes. <laughs> and he's just looking at us. Well, me and, me and, we turn around, we're looking at this guy. Like, where in, do, where did you come from? You know? And this guy looks at us and he goes, what y'all doing? And we're, we're shooting groundhogs. And he looks around, he looks off the distance, he goes, groundhogs. I'm like, yeah. Well, you don't say nothing else. He's just looking at us and looking around. So we go back to spotting, looking around. A minute later, turn around and talk to this guy, and he's gone. And I don't mean walking down the road. He's just not there. And you don't say there's no, it's a big open area. You can't just walk away that quick. You know, we got binoculars. We've been looking around all afternoon. So to this day, I don't know what to make of that. Don't know who it was, where the guy came from. I imagine you didn't hang around much longer. Well, yeah, well you know, he just didn't bother us when he was there, but I've got a few good shots on groundhogs. That's a good story. But, that, yeah, that that was about 1990-91, and we're driving back, and the father was like, man, what, what was that? You know, who was that guy? And I'm like, I don't know, and it don't matter who he was, where did he go? I mean, how did he get up on us? We got two people, one is a police officer, you know, you don't let people sneak up on you. And you can't, I mean, I, you, you couldn't, you know. It's just, I, it's still weird. I don't even know what, uh, how to explain it. Yeah, I love that story. I did good. So, anyway, that's my weird story. So, And you're sticking to it. All right. Sticking to it, so. Well, thanks for calling in. Well, y'all take care, Ron. I'm glad you're doing better, man. Well, I've tried. Woo! Yeah, we, we had a few, rough few days there, but we're good now. Yeah. De- well, Debbie, you were talking about the saw plot. Bye, R.D. You were talking about the Saul Paul family. That might make a good story one of these days. Uh, they have you have you seen their their tombstone in that cemetery? Oh, yes, it's let's the get prettiest this, one. Yeah, let's get this call. Thing. Sorry, let's get this call. Our Thirteen caller quota. Anyway, <laughs> caller, you are now live on Old Town Cleveland. Hello, this is Geneva. Uh, you were talking about uh, Minnie Hickman earlier, Elvis Presley. Yes. yes. Well, Minnie is my cousin. Okay. Oh. Okay. Uh, she's still living. Okay, good. Well, is Luther still living, too? Yeah, pardon? Is Luther still living? Uh, yes. It's, his name was Junior. Everybody called him Junior. Okay. But it's Luther Junior Hickman. Okay. And that's how I'm kin to them, through the Hickmans. 
But uh, many did the arrangement for Dixie when he recorded that. Okay. He met her in Chattanooga at the Reed House. Hmm. And they escorted him in the back way and everything. And he brought her this beautiful gift of a diamond bracelet that was close to over $75,000. Hmm. My goodness. And uh, uh, I see her quite often. They're not in good health right now, but they are still yeah. living. Where do they live? Here in Cleveland? No, they don't. Uh, okay. They live between Chattanooga and, I guess, uh, off of 58 somewhere. Okay. I know right. where they live, but I Very interesting. Well, when I first met her, I thought I'd been a movie star because, you know, <laughs> you know, it, it, when I, in the uh, middle 70s, I mean, yeah. that was big stuff, you know, back in that day. So. Oh, yes. Be yeah. sure yeah. Now. tell them I said hello. I will. And I see them at homecoming every year where uh, Junior's parents are buried, my cousins. Good. And uh, I will tell them. Thank you. I heard their name on the radio, and I just had to call. And it was all very good. Yes, thank you so much for calling, Geneva. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. I love our callers. I know. That was a good call. See, I kind of lost track of them. I didn't know where they were. I was telling Ron I had walked through um, the factory here that prints my books yesterday, and there were so many kind people there that came over and was telling me about, we had talked about we couldn't find coal anymore, and they were telling me where you could find coal and, and telling me stories that were related to it. And I'm saying, why don't you call in instead of telling me you need to call in? But it was so nice that the people out there yeah. Yeah. acknowledge that they enjoy the show. Yeah. Are we the only people in this building right now? Pretty much. Are you sure about that? <laughs> now, uh, the... Um, no. The... Uh, <laughs> Guys from the bistro may be in the back somewhere. Okay, that's who I saw. <laughs> yeah, I was beginning to wonder. Yeah, that's the that's the ghost cook we have here. <laughs> it still startles me too that we'll come in and we'll unlock the door and come in, and then you'll hear somebody, and it's them in the in their <laughs> storage room. <laughs> How funny! We are not alone. <laughs> well, that's what happens when you start talking about spirits, legends, and lore. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, that, a, that's why when you walk into a room, the first thing you do is what? Look Tip around. on the light, because yeah. yeah. that yeah. unknown is yeah. it's yeah. the scariest thing in the world. Oh, yeah. 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 But I think this has been a real fun show. Yeah. I've uh, had a good time. We did not have a show for next week yet, but on the 28th, I've got a fellow. Well, let's see. Yes. I'm confused. Yes, that's right. We don't have one for the 14th, but on the 21st, first. you have some friends coming in. I have my, I'll tell the 28th years is okay. on the 21st. Okay, help me here. And then I have a Mr. Savage coming in, Savage coming in, and he is a surveyor. And he got tangled up in the mess a couple of years ago when he was doing some investigation up in Polk County about where the Tennessee line and the Georgia line used to be. It moved. And he uh, has studied that quite extensively along with other things along those lines and i think he's gonna be a lot of fun especially for me that yeah. likes maps is that and very savage very yeah. savage yeah he's a great guy well, oh yeah his emails are fabulous he don't said let he... ginger come though because she'll talk all the time <laughs> you know that that line that problem starts in Polk county goes through chickamauga because you know, we had the big battle they were saying the georgia line's more this way towards where the water is yeah. but yeah. altoona lake about dried up yeah and uh I think but anyway, he's going to talk about that kind of yeah. stuff, and that referral came from her son. A, a, a lady's son works for Barry, and apparently okay. Barry talks about this stuff okay. all the time. And they said you got to get this guy on your show. We're always looking for new referrals. After nine years, we need new new friends. And on the twenty eighth, uh, we're going to have uh, a tribute to Corky Whitlock. Okay, oh, we've got three or four people who's actually worked with Corky since he got into town, and uh, if you grew up here. Uh, you know who Corky Whitlock is. Not only was he just a broadcaster, he also, the Little League Baseball program we have here, he was fundamental in the development yeah. that here. So yeah. just a great guy, still alive today. Uh, health is not as good as it was at one time, yeah. but uh, well, that'd be a great we're, we're just going to do a tribute to him. So we got a couple more. Uh, we got the rest of October except for next week, and that will uh, – it. Uh, somebody always volunteers. And we've got another uh, – uh, coming up soon in a program where we're going to talk about how things changed from Bradley High School 
to Bradley High School. <laughs> the old Bradley High School to the new high school. The culture changed tremendously in the 70s, 72. We're going to have some teachers and former administrators come in and talk about getting the new Bradley and, and the transfer and how it affected the kids and how it affected the community. And so I think that'd be fun. I believe Jerry Frazier is going to head, head that up for us. I graduated from the old Bradley, 72, the last class. And I'll tell you how the culture was. 70, you know, 70 is long hair, not at Bradley High School. Your hair could not touch your ears. Your eyes could not touch your eyebrows. Your eyes no, could not touch your eyebrows. Your hair could not touch your eyebrows. <laughs> your hair could not touch touch your collar. No facial hair whatsoever. Girls could not wear pants. I could wear, wear a mini skirt. They could wear mini skirts. I was in favor of that rule. <laughs> that was one of my favorite rules of all time in high school. But. Uh, but it, it was, uh, and then they went to the new Bradley, and they just threw all that out. I'm like, you know, you, you look at these old movies, and uh, even in the, the 60s and early 70s, when they go to sporting events or whatever, everybody's got on ties and, mm-hmm. you know, dressed up, and now look what you got. Yeah, you Walmart. Know. Yeah, They don't <laughs> even dress up to go to church anymore. No, no. Uh, church no. has even changed no. now. No, no you, would, you wouldn't enter church casual. without a tie. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's mm-hmm. true. Now, but now you wouldn't enter church unless you have on blue jeans and a ratty shirt. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I still can't go out anywhere with my shirt tail out. I still just want to. Maybe that style will come back around at one time. Yeah, I don't know. It, it, it'll change. But uh... my my great 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 grandmother was a member of St. Luke's. Oh, really? Oh, interesting. Yeah. They keep good records too. You probably oh. can go in there and see where she signed documents and stuff. Yeah, she joined like about the year. 1900 and something wow 117 years later you know her great 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 grandson's right across the road there at a at a arts event Mm -hmm. yeah it's it's and that is such a beautiful church and i you we really have to commend the folks there on the um facing broad street there once was a huge house which was nina craig miles grandfather's home dr thompson's home and uh, the church kept it for a number of years, and it was just too big to keep mm-hmm. up with. And so they took it down and put up the educational building. But there's some aerial photographs that the top of that house is huge. And the Inmans had a house there on that lot, too, that I believed um, it was um, it was there, and it burned in 1898. I'm trying to read a note here and talk at the same time. And after the fire, J.H. Craig Mile built the house later known as the George Hardwick Senior Home, which is now our Cleveland Public Library that has been beautifully saved and used for this community. Yeah. See, I didn't realize that home was where uh, Will, uh, Mark, uh, Will Hardwick lived, one of the three guys yes. that was killed in the, yes. the train crash. Yes. Uh, and the monument there, I didn't realize that was his house right there. Yes, and, and the, there was no bodies returned and so they put the monument up to remember and it was out in the middle of the country then you could put your own monument up nobody cared well now it's now since you mentioned that i I think i'm right on this uh i believe i saw this in the newspaper this sunday also they're having the history branch open the i am so glad you remembered that uh and this is a one-time only affair i think right it'd be kind of interesting margo That's walked in margo still walked in and took over as the director of the history branch and they said oh by the way we're starting a remodel tomorrow and so she has spent months yeah. inside that old historic building with lots of nice people that have been fixing things the right way the upstairs will be open tomorrow tomorrow only it's going to be for an hour before the history historical society meeting across the street and for about an hour or so afterwards so you could come early go over there look at the old library and then come across the street to our program i think it had well i think it would have just been too much for us to try to have met over there and people looking at yeah. the remodeling yeah. too is that the craig miles house yes it is did the craig miles build the st luke's church yes wow. but now there's different craig miles too but uh, and i can't sort them out but nina's parents Nina got killed at a railroad crossing uh, on a buggy with her grandpa, Mr. Dr. Thompson. And after her death, she was killed on St. Luke's Day. They decided to build a memorial to their child. They built the church and the mausoleum there on the properties. Mm -hmm. She played 
in a garden that was right there where the ma- mausoleum is now. Oh, then the fam- playground. Yes, and the family had a whole line of tragic events. There was a young brother that died after Nina. The dad fell off a ladder and got blood poisoning and died, and Mom got run over by a car all within, you know, probably 10 or 15 years. They all died and are in there. And I believe maybe her um, stepdad is buried in there also. I can't. I think so. I Cross, think so. Yeah. Yeah. Was Dr. Thompson buried? Uh, Fort Hill. Fort Hill. Fort Hill. Yeah. yeah. They got a big they did his story last mm-hmm. year now the big th- the bad news about fort hill cemetery is that mr roth for a number since the time he died had a big copper piping that surrounded his grave and some heathen stole it just about two years ago yeah Mm. You know, yeah. Somebody said, Debbie, have you checked on Roth's grave? And I said, uh, nope. And he said, I think the copper's gone. And we went up there, and I was just heartbroken. Mm-hmm. And somebody had taken a tremendous amount of time and had the right equipment. It was sawed off just perfectly. Well, the police don't patrol it enough. No. Well, it, 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 it's so big, and uh, we've asked them to patrol quite a bit because we had a little bit of, you know, stuff going on up there yeah. that shouldn't have been going on. And, and Dennis, also, the Craig Mile Hall that you've seen downtown, yeah. uh, that's also part of the Craig Mile family. Oh, it's 12th Oh. Yeah, okay. They're a very wealthy family. But at, at one point, he had lost everything he had, mm-hmm. and he rebuilt his family. Yeah, well, the, the that's Civil impressive. War, uh, he and his brother, one of them sold supplies to the, su- the South, and one of them sold supplies to the North, so they both made their, a lot of money back, but they had lost a lot. You follow what, words? What? Tell us about it one more time. Okay, thank you. Spirits, Legends, and Lore uh, will be Friday the 13th at 7 o'clock at the Buzz Oaks Theater, which is also known as the Black Box Theater, Lee University Communications Building. Uh, tickets are $10 a piece at Bank of Cleveland and the Chamber of Commerce, and students can come for $5. It's one night only, uh, and um, I hope that you can come and enjoy the, the, the proceeds for this goes to Arts and Education, uh, if your children and your grandchildren get to see a play at school, a lot of this money will help they provide put a lot of money in the school. To those there. It, it takes a lot of money. And also the Cleveland Storytelling Guild will get a part of this money, too. Right. Hmm. And uh, I'd like to thank Dennis Stewart for being here. And uh, uh, two of his books are going to be featured in the yes, storytelling. There are six stories of the song. Yes. So uh, we're looking forward to that uh, next Friday night. Uh, dining with the Dead's up in Athens in a couple of weeks, too. Um, or, or is it Friday night? Uh, uh, I believe it's Friday night, same night. Mm-hmm. Well, don't, don't, we won't talk about that, then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's Friday the 13th. Also. Yeah, and the tickets are $15, and it usually sells out. So, but, uh, uh Cleveland folks, if you're interested in these no, stories. It's wh- Saturday, October 22nd, 630. Huh. I thought I saw something on, because it well, was a conflict. Okay. Maybe it was something else then. There was something else happening on the Friday 13th uh, away from Cleveland. Because I c- was bad because I couldn't go. Cause See, of this di- dining with the Dead's in Inglewood at the cemetery, Cochran mm-hmm. Cemetery. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm not sure now. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm not sure either. So if you're interested, I wrote down last week it was on the 22nd. So okay. I don't know. Well, it's always, we tell all of our. Uh, <laughs> we listen. almost give the facts here. <laughs> <laughs> we tell all of our friends. Uh, that it's up to you to save the history of our community and of your family, more particularly. So you did get your oldest members of your family. Get those pictures from out and up and under the bed. Right. And get some archival labels, archival ink, write on those labels and put it on the back of the photos. And uh, Can I say something there? Sure, go ahead. Because you'll always remember Pearl Harbor but you may not always remember Aunt Pearl. Oh, you just <laughs> throw her alive. He knows a lot. Anyway, you got to do that. And like he said, okay. don't go to Down into the Dead on October 20, uh, 22nd because that was last year. Okay. <laughs> I, I'm pretty sure it's a 13th. Uh, yeah, I, that's yeah. when I would do it. All right. The, the but, hey, well. make sure you go next Friday night. It's going to be a great event, great stories. I've been to the storytelling in the past. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think this setting is going to be better for you. It, it is. So far, it has been. And thank you for the opportunity to, to come. Oh, we well, thank you for you. the stories. And, uh, you know, it's uh, been fun. And I'd like to thank Mike Smith for confirming that that light went on and off for me. <laughs> <laughs> 
All right, folks, we'll see you next week here on Old Town Cleveland. <laughs> Hello, I'm Shelley Duvall. And you're listening to WOOPLP, Cleveland, Tennessee. Whoop FM is a broadcasting service of the Traditional Music Resource Center, and we play America's original music. Charlie Johnson and she's really looking 